There were three mausoleums in the Soviet Union, housing three such important historical figures that after their death, it was decided not to bury, but to embalm them. The first one was built in Vinitsa for the surgeon Pirogov. Within the second one in Moscow lays the leader of the revolution, Vladimir Lenin. But few know of the third one. Odessa Oblast is a small town in Kotovsk. Here, there is the crypt mausoleum holding the embalmed body of Grigory Kotovsky, legendary Red Commander of the Civil War. This mausoleum was built immediately after the mysterious murder of Grigory Kotovsky and buried inside of it, along with the body, remains a hidden mystery of the death of a man more influential than Stalin. Odessa Oblast in August of 1925, Shebanka village, where Olga Kotovskaya was in the final month of her pregnancy. She suffered, often, from pain and insomnia. That long, hot night, she could not sleep as she waited for her husband Grigory to return. At around 2 a.m., the wife of the Red Commander finally managed to fall asleep. Suddenly, Olga awakened, startled, Clutching her stomach, Olga ran to the window. Outside her window, in the street, a crowd flocked. People surrounded a body, sprawled on the ground. It was Olga's husband, Grigory Kotovsky. Chebanka villagers were terrified. Who would dare to kill one of the most influential people of the Soviet Union? During his life, Grigory Kotovsky was dubbed the chieftain from hell. Although a thug and a murderer, as Russia's Red Commander, Stalin regarded him to be the bravest among the humble Soviet commanders and most humble amongst the brave. What was never mentioned in the Soviet propaganda was who Grigory Kotovsky truly was and who, in fact, needed his death. Olga Kotovskaya lay crying, grasping her pregnant stomach. Her new daughter, Lenochka, born only a few days later, would never know her father. The wife of the dead Comcor was stunned by what followed. While her relatives collected around her to calm her, the former commander's comrade, Zayda Meyer, silently entered her home. Unlike the others, Mayer did not attempt to comfort her, nor did he offer his help. Instead, he knelt down beside her and begged forgiveness. It was he who killed her husband, his friend Grigory Kotovsky. Olga Petrovna became hysterical, driving this murderer from her home. In the confusion, Mayer vanished and a few hours later was arrested. News of the Kotovsky murder reached Moscow and flew from mouth to mouth, creating a huge scandal. Kotovsky had been loved by millions of Soviet citizens. However, something quite unusual occurred. The death of the Comcor was simply ignored. Only a single newspaper reported the murder in Chebanka, the Pravda. We managed to find a rare issue stored in the newspaper department of the Vernadsky National Library in the Ukraine. On the night of the 6th of August, it reports, at the Sovkoz Chebanka, 30 miles away from Odessa, the untimely death of a member of the Union, the Ukrainian and Moldovan Central Election Commission, commander of the Cavalry Corps, Comrade Kotovsky. Why was the manslaughter of this legendary Comcor so modestly reported? Just a single mention of no more than an untimely death. Even the murderer's name was not specified. The day following the murder of Comcor, a group of embalmers arrived in Odessa from Moscow. It was headed by Professor Vorobyov, who in 1924 embalmed the body of Vladimir Lenin. Medics began working on the body of Kotovsky. Meanwhile, not far from Odessa, a mausoleum was being erected. 
In 1941, the mausoleum of Kotovsky was left to its fate. Unlike Lenin's mausoleum, this one was not removed from the town during the German offensive on Moscow, and the first thing the Nazis did on their arrival at Kotovsk was to destroy the Komkor mausoleum and dispose of Kotovsky's body. Coming up, whose way did this legendary concourse stand in? Who gave the order that executed murderer Zayda Meyer? Why do historians now call Meyer the first Soviet killer? We will meet the grandson of Grigory Kotovsky and find out what secret his grandfather had been hiding his whole life. We will also learn why all the investigation materials mysteriously disappeared after the death of Kotovsky to be confiscated to the special funds of the security service. And we will find a place where today lay the bones of the legendary Comcor. Chabanka village near Odessa. Two gunshots murdered the Red Commander, the man of legend, Grigory Kotovsky, the killer his comrade, Zayda Meyer. However, his motive remains unknown. At first, Meyer insisted the murder of Kotovsky was no accident. Raging jealousy, he claimed as his motive, because of an alleged affair between the Comcor and his wife. During an interrogation, she proceeded to deny her husband's allegation and testified that there had been no intimate relationship between the two. The most probable cause for his murder and the likely events of that fateful night were soon to be discovered. Yes, the fact was, he did slay Kotovsky. Nevertheless, this more likely happened because the concourse stood in the way of Meyer's career. At that time, Meyer had been security chief at a sugar factory. During the trial, he admitted that he wanted to become the head of this factory. But Kotovsky did not want to promote him, and this resulted in the Comcor slaughter. This became the story behind the murder. Why then, after such a deviant act, did the frightened murderer wind up on his knees begging for the forgiveness of Kotovsky's wife, Olga? Nevertheless, the murder investigators accepted this motive as true. A swift trial followed, but the verdict shocked everyone. By law, Meyer should have been shot with his family deported to Siberia. But the assassin of the great commander was not executed, simply sentenced to a 10-year imprisonment. What's more, although this was a time that even minor thieves were executed in this country, three years after this verdict, Kotovsky's assassin was mysteriously released for exemplary behavior. Quite extraordinary that during this morally deficient time, crammed with brutality and loss of millions of lives in the First World and Civil Wars, with a country so swathed in human blood and life of such little value that the state so easily reversed itself to spare assassin Meyer Zayda. Grigory Kotovsky and Zayda Meyer met in 1918. At that time, Kotovsky had been an underground Bolshevik agent and a bandit chased by police and Meyer was owner of the best brothel in Odessa, one of the richest men in the city. Zayda Meyer was one of Odessa's first slaveholders of whites. Girls from Odessa and the Ukraine were by force shipped to Turkish harems and brothels, dependent territories of the Turkish Empire, Egypt, North America and to Europe. Zayda Meyer headed over a filthy business. Ironically, even his own sister and wife were prostitutes in his organization. Fleeing from a police chase, Kotovsky found a place to hide within Meyer's brothel, where he found protection while in pursuit. Meyer concealed the fugitive for several days while feeding and caring of his needs. At this time, the two became friends. In 
Zayda Meir lived in this house in 1918. However, four years later, Meyer became homeless and without a livelihood. This time, Kotovsky returned the debt and found Meyer a place to work. However, what ultimately made the former owner of the brothel betray his comrade to pull the trigger of a gun not once, but twice? Coming up, the true life story of bandit and comcore Kotovsky. What linked Kotovsky with Meyer? Why would historians call the owner of the Odessa brothel the first killer of the Soviet Union? Also, an incredible find, Kotovsky's autobiography. In 1924, one year prior to his death, Grigory Kotovsky wrote a manuscript, his memoirs. However, his disclosed birth date had been falsified along with six years of his life conveniently left out of the document. But why would Kotovsky need to deceive? Grigory Kotovsky claimed in his memoirs that his birth year was 1887 in the Moldovan town of Hincesti. But historians are certain that Kotovsky lied. He was actually born in 1881, six years earlier than the date in his autobiography. What secret was the legendary Comcor hiding? What happened during these six concealed years? It turns out that for six years, until 1917, the legendary commander had been a criminal. A huge number of modern adventurers and criminals correct some of the dates, which may include their birth, and hide some details. Why would Kotovsky do such a thing? Perhaps to hide some previous convictions? For example, Kotovsky attempted to conceal information about his first conviction. As for the more recent criminal convictions, he constructed a tale told to fellow Bolsheviks that he defended the poor and shared the spoils with the common folk of Bessarabia and the Kherson province. Here is the real story behind the life of the Red Comcor, later discovered through research. Kotovsky had been a descendant of Moldovia. In his early childhood, Grigori fell down some stairs, which may have contributed to his obtaining a stutter. This caused the boy to become reserved and rather shy, rarely communicating with his peers. He, however, adored reading and liked to dream. In his dreams, Kotovsky imagined himself the famous robber of Sherwood Forest, Robin Hood, or pirate Blackbeard, sometimes Tarzan. To this unhealthy spirited child, all of these heroic characters seem to be attainable divinities. There were five children in the Kotovsky family, with Grigori the youngest and the most impressionable. The sudden death of his mother led to the young boy's first attack of epilepsy soon after her funeral. Little Grigory Kotovsky watched his mother die. It was difficult enough she died, but he was forced to witness this. And again, this coincided with his first attack of epilepsy. This seems to have contributed to the struggles he encountered throughout his life. He stammered badly and he became uncomfortably nervous. At the age of 14, the boy carried on in life with epilepsy, with the stigma of a stutter. Then, he had lost his last close comfort, his father. Now, he would have to care for himself, and so he enrolled himself into a school of agriculture, where he turned much of his attention to his body and strength. As a result, this former weakling became the strongest amongst his peers. His character hardened, and he began to control everything with his will. People around Kotovsky began to respect, even fear him. In her memoirs, Kotovsky's sister Sofia reveals that at that time, no one could beat Grigori. He could easily put anyone who dared to mock his stuttering defect in their place. 
Kotovsky became a statuesque boy, actively into sport. While he was fond of reading, he revered his adventure books, his favorite, Tarzan. The book captivated him. Naturally, it also influenced his adventurous character and the way he perceived his actions. Kotovsky experienced his first love. To receive the diploma of a specialized school, he had to undergo some on-job training. Grigory became an assistant manager of the estate of Skopovsky, the landlord. The landlord's wife became attracted immediately to this self-assured, handsome student. Soon, they began to meet secretly. However, the affair was split up by the husband. Landlord Skopovsky discovered the affair. As Kotovsky recalled in his writings on discovery, Skopovsky raised his whip and struck him with all his might in the face. What occurred next sealed forever Kotovsky's fate. In response, Kotovsky counteracted and began to beat the landlord until stopped by the servants. The landlord then ordered his men to beat Grigory almost to death and then undressed him and threw him out of the estate. Nobody ever humiliated Kotovsky like that again. Insulted and beaten, he walked off. After that, Grigori tried twice to locate a job and briefly worked for other landlords, but his bad reputation haunted him. At another job, he was accused of feigning documents, then of stealing the money. This caused a police chase, and Kotovsky had to hide. The next two years, having no job or money, he knocked about North Moldova, in Bessarabia, where he often committed petty thefts. It was here that he first acquainted with the Essas, activists and members of a terrorist group banned in the Russian Empire, a socialist revolutionary party. The group provided Kotovsky with clothes, food and accommodation at their secret address. Grigory found much in common with them, first and foremost, a hatred for the regime. It was then when Kotovsky felt like a hero from his favorite children's books, Robin Hood. With his help, dozens of estates in Bessarabia were plundered. Robert Kotovsky became wanted as a dangerous criminal, a reward placed on his head. It took several months for the elusive Kotovsky to decide to secede from the Essers to plunder landlords on his own. Kotovsky found himself 20 reliable men, former peasants, prisoners, workers, even circus actors. Landlords feared and hated Kotovsky, and his plundering attacks became legendary. One of Odessa's landlords boasted he was not afraid of Kotovsky because he built an alarm button connected to the police station onto the floor of his cabinet. When Kotovsky learned about this self-assured landlord, he effortlessly broke into his estate. Instead of commanding the man to raise his hands in the air, Kotovsky, with a smile, told the frightened landlord to raise his feet. Feet on the table. I said now. It is not known whether he actually shared the money with the poor peasants, but people literally prayed for this audacious robber. Kotovsky constantly stated he was Robin Hood, that he robbed from the rich and gave to the poor. But this was not entirely true, because he and his closest friends accumulated a large quantity of loot. After several years of pillaging and collecting, Kotovsky became rich. He dined at the best restaurants, appeared in public, and no longer talked about his political preferences. But his former friends, the Essers, saw through him. 
To avenge him, they informed the police of his secret address, where the bandit leader hid. Kotovsky was later arrested. At the trial, he proudly christened himself Robin Hood and claimed his actions to be dictated by his honorable sense of justice. The judges, however, were not amused, and he was sentenced to 12 years of hard labor. Chisinau Prison. From the earliest days of his imprisonment, Kotovsky devised an escape plan. After his big trial, he became popular as a convict. Women often came to visit him in prison. These women were romantic fans, swayed by this famous noble bandit and his tales. He was aware of his charisma, his pizzazz. He realized just how handsome he was. He became a woman's man. In his lifetime, he had a number of passions, books, sports, horses, and of course, women. As a matter of fact, women would save the romantic bandit several times. One particularly fanatical female visitor helped Kotovsky implement his plan of escape by sneaking in a pack of cigarettes laced with opium, a lady's gun, a file baked in bread, and a thin silk cord. Everything Kotovsky needed to escape. So one night, Kotovsky gave the cigarettes to the guards. Once they were out of commission, he then soared through iron bars and made his daring escape. This, however, was just the start of his prison saga. Kotovsky lasted a mere few days outside of the prison walls before he was once again arrested, brought this time to Nikolaev, a strict security prison, and from there, he was transported to the east of Russia. Kotovsky sat in prison 10 more years. He built, along with his fellow inmates, the Amur Railway and worked in the Nachinsk mines. Viktor Fatelberg Blank, researcher of the gangster world of Odessa, believes that during his prison time, future legendary Komkor Kotovsky was not an inmate who just sat passively around. It's more likely that he veiled his activities while behind bars, and this helped him to build an underworld reputation in the criminal sphere. In this circle, he belonged to its elite. Not only did criminals become aware of it, but also the police. This is a description of Kotovsky, which followed him during his transportation. Height, 174 centimeters, strong constitution, staggers while walking, round head, brown eyes, stammers. Kotovsky had tattooed eyelids, and that indicated he belonged to the highest hierarchy of the gangster world. His tattoos consisted of dots encircling his eyelids in a figure of eight. When he became a red commander, Gregory Kotovsky wanted them removed. But in those times, there were no specialists. And so he had to go through life with them on his face. And when he died, the tattoos went with him. Such tattoos thus implicate him and his life as a bandit and underworld leader. It was 1913. The alarm sounded at the Nachinsk mines. Escape. Among the prisoners, one was missing. The underworld leader, Gregory Kotovsky, escaped, killing two guards in the process. This time, he was never found. He spent two more years in hiding, working as a loader, and finally appeared in Odessa. By now, Gregory was 32, no longer a young outcast student, nor Robin Hood. He was a former prisoner and experienced gangster. Out of prison, he carefully prepared for brand new attacks. Within a few years, Kotovsky became a terror in Odessa's gangster world. It was believed he could read minds simply by looking into other people's eyes. He would learn about people by using his eyes, which he did often. He would categorize men and choose the ones he liked to be part of his crew. In those days, Odessa was the crime capital of the Russian Empire. Numerous underworld gangsters operated in this region. The police simply had no time to catch all of them. They were looking specifically for Kotovsky, searching all his secret addresses. But Kotovsky lived out in the open at the best hotel of Odessa, Bessarabia. Before each raid, Gregory carefully disguised himself. Every time he went out, it was in a new image. Kotovsky was renowned throughout Odessa, an extremely famous figure. 
newspapers through the years 1915 through 1917 were loaded with his pictures. This meant that he could have easily been identified. Nonetheless, if he attended the theater or went out, he would simply stick on his face a beard or a mustache and become incognito. These facts of Kotovsky's life were to be later concealed within the Soviet Union's official history books. And Kotovsky himself purely eliminated the years from his own memoirs. What remained were only high-flying, blurry lines. By force and terror, I took away material possession from exploiters and gave them to those who needed these riches. Without knowing of the party, I was already a Bolshevik. Three years of freedom from jail equated to three years of debauchery and plundering. But by 1916, his luck ran out. Legendary robber caught. Romantic bandit Kotovsky brought into police station. Robin Hood of Bessarabia was taken. These became the headlines making Odessa's newspapers. Police triumphed. It was during a raid that Kotovsky fell into their trap and finally found himself behind bars. Primorsky Boulevard 7. In 1916, fates of thousands of prisoners were decided here. In this building was the military district court of Odessa, and it was here that Grigory Kotovsky was tried and convicted. Nineteen sixteen, the Russian Empire was engaged in the First World War, lasting two years. The country was in a state of martial law. All death sentences were to be approved by the commander of the Western Front, General Brusilov. As Kotovsky awaited his execution, he wrote a petition for clemency. But rather than addressing his petition to the general, he sent it to the general's wife, Brusilova. She read a letter overflowing with repentance and written as if a dramatic work and felt remorse for the handsome bandit. A few weeks later, General Brusilov replaced Kotovsky's death penalty with life imprisonment. 1917, revolution. The provisional government leads the country out of war with political prisoners released. However, convicted of robbery, former condemned Kotovsky does not receive this amnesty. The civil war bursts out and the front is destroyed. Ruin and famine spreads across the country. Suddenly, from the prison cell, criminal, bandit and recidivist Kotovsky requests that he be sent out to the front. He wishes to atone for his past with his own blood. This is incredible, but a man with this heinous past, once convicted to die, is released. Kotovsky passed the cavalry regiment military training in one crash course and went on to war as a private. In a few years, he became a commander, then joined the Bolsheviks. This is where his talents became fully appreciated. Here, his own brigade took under command and with a mission to destroy the remnants of the UNR army and Denikin's forces. He immediately introduced his new brigade to iron discipline. Horses must be of the same color. Soldiers must wear clean and expensive uniforms. Men must do morning exercises, then douse themselves with cold water. Kotovsky's orders were not open for discussion. Desertion, rape or murder of peasants were punishable by execution. 1918, Odessa's rule is in constant change. The city becomes white, then red, and then independent. But despite everything, Kotovsky remains in Odessa. Sometimes he has to hide from his pursuers. It is during this time, a certain man visits the best brothel in the city. He is met by the owner of the establishment, Zayda Meyer, who asks what kind of woman the client wants. This visitor answers that he is not interested in a prostitute, but in need of a key to the attic. Meyer, recognizing Kutovsky, hands him the key. 
The brigade commander spends a few days in hiding within this attic, and before he departs the establishment, he informs Mayer that he is indebted to him. 1920, Kotovsky is the best commander of the Red Army. On his chest are decorations of three orders of the Red Banner and the honorable revolutionary weapon, the sword. These are the highest awards in the Red Army. They were received for the destruction of the army's remnants in the Ukrainian National Republic, for the liberation of Tiraspol, for the suppression of the peasant uprising in Tambov province, and for the termination of the army of Ataman Tutunik. Coming up, historians are certain Stalin himself is involved in the murder of Kotovsky. We will visit Kotovsk, find the tomb of the commander, and learn why Grigory Kotovsky was slayed. The civil war has ended. This year, the Bolsheviks liquidate the last brothel in Odessa. Zayda Meyer is left without work. And so he pays his own visit to Kotovsky, who owes him a favor. And the commander appoints Meyer as security chief of one of the sugar factories. December the 30th, 1922. On the map appears a new country, the largest in the world, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. The civil war is over, and Lenin becomes the first leader of the country. But after two years, Lenin dies, and in his place comes Joseph Stalin. Stalin begins a struggle for the sole control of the country. He doesn't need any rebellious leaders. During this time, the country is led by its military men, many of them with dark pasts, murderers, robbers and gang leaders. Grigory Kotovsky is among his chief people. Out of Kotovsky's advice to Stalin, Moldavian Autonomous Socialist Republic is added into the Soviet Union. Kotovsky himself becomes its informal leader. His aim is to capture and unite all the lands of Bessarabia, even those belonging to Romania, However, the CC does not want war with Romania. Kremlin politicians, however, are too busy with the internecine wars to protest. Stalin, by eliminating his rivals, is advancing to a sole rule. Kotovsky is forbidden to aggravate this political situation. This enrages him so much that the Comcor leaves his corpus and goes on holiday with his wife and son to Jabanka village in Odessa Oblast. 1925. Kotovsky is now 44, a married man and father. He has a son. A few days later, his daughter is to be born. Their holiday is interrupted by a telegram from Moscow. The People's Commissar of the USSR appoints Kotovsky his deputy. In this country, ruled by military men, he is destined to become the Prime Minister. Grigory Kotovsky celebrates his victory. He hastily packs his things and gets ready to go to Moscow. But in the evening of August the 6th, on the eve of his departure, Kotovsky is invited to a party. 2 a.m. Kotovsky returns home. He turns into his yard. In just a few steps, he will be at home. Suddenly, Kotovsky notices Meyer. Komkor is pleasantly surprised. He doesn't expect to see his friend in Chebanka. He stretches out his hand in greeting. Meyer also stretches out his hand, but with a revolver in it. Turning away and clenching his teeth, Meyer pulls the trigger. Kotovsky falls to the ground, but he was still alive. Then, Meyer takes a second shot. This shot is fatal.
On this site of cottages, there was once old Chabanka, the village where Kotovsky was killed. Mayer, who murdered the legendary commander, was sentenced not to execution, but to 10 years of imprisonment. Of the 10 years, the killer remained in prison for only three. He was released for exemplary behavior, but Mayer didn't enjoy his freedom for long. Men of Kotovsky awarded him with a death sentence. Modern historians claim in the mid-20s, Stalin began to consolidate and gain sole power in the USSR. He managed to remove his main competitor, Leon Trotsky, from leadership. Among all the Red Commanders, only Frunze and Kotovsky remained disobedient to him. It was Grigory Kotovsky who Stalin feared the most. He knew he was a cruel and influential man, subversively supported by the army, and this meant he needed to get rid of his opponent. Kotovsky was an extremely devious person, difficult for the authorities to control, and he was connected to the criminal world, where he maintained strong ties. This man was connected to business. What's more, this man was attempting to make himself a leader of the Moldavian Autonomous Republic. More than likely, he would become leader of all Bessarabia as well. Stalin himself would not be able to accuse Kotovsky of treason to execute him. The soldiers trusted their commander way too much. Thus, a move like this would likely have caused a military coup. But by hiring an assassin, he could get the job done cleanly. What's more, this had to be a person from the commander's surroundings. Otherwise, it would not be possible to reach him. Therefore, Stalin hired Zayda Meyer. However, how he convinced this poor former owner of a brothel to commit this heinous crime is still a great mystery. Historians remain certain that this was the first contract murder in the Soviet Union, and Meyer was the first Soviet killer, and the client was Stalin personally. Elena Kotovskaya named her son in honor of his grandfather, Grigory. We have managed to meet him and learn exactly whom he and his mother believed to be guilty of the murder of the legendary Comcor. I believe it was actually Stalin, because he wiped out so much of the Soviet army and intelligentsia. Despite the fact that he was a shrewd man, he'd done many horrible things while he was in power. He was a terrible dictator, and Stalin could not tolerate competition. We know Frunze died on the operating table. He wasn't through. He was killed. There are also rumors that suggest it was on the orders of Stalin. A number of other prominent public figures were killed too. The grandson of the Comcor has said that immediately after the murder of Kotovsky, all of the remaining investigation materials were then transported to Moscow. I know that Stalin came into power very shrewdly, and he managed to push aside all other major public figures to come to power. Apparently, he was a cardinal. He already had some kind of power even back then. He assumed that if Grigori was replaced by Frunze, he could be dangerous. And so Frunze was killed. We head now to Bazula, a small town in the Odessa Oblast, this is where Grigory Kotovsky was buried. Now, the town of Berzula no longer exists. 73 years ago, it was renamed Kotovsk, a town in Odessa Oblast. It was here where before 1941 that a mausoleum held the remains of Kotovsky. The Comcor was buried with honors. At his funeral gathered thousands of soldiers. His wife stood near the coffin. She was about to give birth. And 
when the salute was given in honor of the Comcor, Olga Kotovskaya went into labor. The last child of Kotovsky, his daughter Lenochka, was born and never saw her father alive. The child, Olga Petrovna, would only see her father behind the glass in the mausoleum. However, the embalmed body of the Comcor was not destined to remain there long. During the war, it disappeared and the mausoleum was destroyed. In the heart of Kotovsk, we found a monument. It was established in 1965 in honor of the legendary Comcor. Previously, here stood the mausoleum. It was destroyed by the Nazis in 1941, while the commander's body was thrown into an ordinary pit. Eventually, he was found by simple workers, and in 1944, reburied. It turned out that here remains an underground portion of the destroyed mausoleum, and in it, finally found peace, Robin Hood of Odessa and legendary Comcor Gregory Kotovsky. We received a unique opportunity to get inside the mausoleum, which has been closed for many decades. The bones of Kotovsky rest in this coffin. Today, Kotovsky's grave is a zinc coffin and a dirty blanket which covers the coffin. Under the blanket, there is a skull of the man who once was the storm of the Odessa Raiders, Bessarabian Robin Hood and the legendary Comcor. A few months later, Frunze dies on the operating table. As the Politburo reported, due to an unsuccessful surgery. So why was Frunze sent to that operation? It's a fact that Stalin had already been strengthening his power, and it's clear that he didn't need the independent Red Army. After his removal of Kotovsky and Frunze, there continued a series of murders and repressed stories within the Union. 1936. Shot, Grigory Zinoviev, the instigator of Stalin's appointment to the post of General Secretary of the CC of the Communist Party. 1937. Killed. Marshal of the Red Army, Mikhail Tukhachevsky, and a member of the Politburo, Grigory Ordjonikidze. 1940. Killed. Stalin's chief opponent, Leon Trotsky. In total, before the Second World War in the Soviet Army, 500 commanders of the highest rank were eliminated. And the first warning signal sounded on August the 6th, 1925, in a seaside village of Chebanka. He was dancing. He was gasping for breath. But the applause continued, becoming louder. His heart was in his mouth. The future leader of the powerful nation, Nikita Sergeyevich Khrushchev, performed his play. He was dancing hopak at Comrade Stalin's command. Having lost his strength, he sat down on a chair and felt something soft and wet burst under him. Beria had placed a tomato under him. The audience burst out laughing. A few years later, everyone was dead. The lucky ones died of natural causes. Some were executed.
This funny and absurd little man, Stalin's misunderstood court jester, Nikita Sergeyevich Khrushchev, took care of it. For 20 years, the Kremlin's fool concealed himself behind the fool's mask. He fawned and abased himself, all for the one cause, to survive, to come to the superpower, and at last, to take vengeance on his bitter enemy, Stalin. The personal tragedy of the funniest general secretary of the USSR, what led to Nikita Khrushchev's murderous deeds, and what was the sin against the Kremlin's fool? for which Stalin had to pay with his life. Nineteen twenty one, Donetsk. He is happy. He is racing to get home to see his wife and embrace his children. They haven't seen each other for three years. Throughout this time, at the front of the Civil War, he thought about them. Dear Frosia is a treasure, the only woman who could properly understand, protect, and give him support. And she gave him the most precious gift of all, faith in himself that Khrushchev had needed since he was a child. 1902, village of Kalinovka. That day, Nikita failed to get to school. The classmates formed a circle around him. They were pulling his clothes and laughing. They repeated this bullying almost every day. The boy's family was starving, which is why he had to go to school in castoffs. He was ashamed and tried to keep away from the other children. But his silence only excited the young bullies. Nikita kept silent, lowering his eyes but the classmates still mocked him. He didn't see the faces of his torturers, didn't hear them laugh. All he wanted was for it to stop. He slowly raised his head. The laughing stopped. Nikita waved his hands and sang out at the top of his voice. There was such resoluteness in his movements and voice that the classmates were mesmerized. When he stopped singing, they cheered, artist. Artist. He was dumbfounded. It turned out that the best way to deflect their bullying was to act the fool. For years, though, he remembered the bitter taste of humiliation and became more unsociable and unapproachable until he met Frosia. She was sincere and trustful and without malice. Under her influence, Nikita's damaged soul gradually melted. They were in love and were soon married. Frosia supported everything he did. And Nikita tried hard to make his beloved wife proud of him. He got a job in the plant and worked hard. He even joined the Bolsheviks party. But he sidelined party affairs and a social life in favor of a cozy home life. He looked into Frosia's loving eyes and at his cheerful children and felt so happy. Soon, he would embrace them all. He kicked at the door with all his strength. Gloomy and foreign faces, a silence that could kill, a coffin, strangers, his children in tears. No, it's impossible. He threw himself on the coffin. He embraced the cold body and burst into tears. Frosia, why? He didn't notice his scared children trying desperately to snuggle up to him. 
He didn't hear the neighbors telling him about the terrible typhoid epidemic that claimed thousands of lives, including his Frosia. There was only one thing on his mind, how to live without her. He felt defeated and depressed. His dreams and his plans for the future no longer mattered as he had lost the most important person in the world. After his wife's death, he couldn't stay in their house. He took the children and moved to a small apartment. He broke all communications with the outside. It seemed that nothing could bring him back to life. Until one day, there was a knock at his door. The young party instructor, Nina Kukachuk, decided to inquire why the comrade Khrushchev had been ignoring party meetings for the last year. Is this proper behavior for a Bolshevik? Nina was surprised by his droopy shoulders, pale face and piercing eyes. He had the look of a wounded animal. Nina heard about the tragedy that had happened in the Khrushchev's home one year earlier. But she couldn't believe that Nikita had taken the loss so badly. After that, she visited him often, looking after him and his children. Nina Kukachuk became Khrushchev's trusty helpmate for the rest of his life. Although they weren't married, they lived together in a common law marriage for over 50 years. He never loved her, but treated her with respect and gratitude. She took care of the housekeeping and his children, and inspired Khrushchev to make a career in the party. He was rarely at home and devoted less attention to his children. He even tried to avoid them. The children bore a strong resemblance to Frosia. He grieved for them. It took time for the wounds of loss to heal. The children needed their father's attention, but Nikita tried not to think about it. Meanwhile, his elder son, Leonya, was terribly jealous of his stepmother. He infuriated Nina with his behavior, trying to attract his father's attention. Some years later, Khrushchev felt incredibly sorry that he had ignored his son. Отказавшись во многом от теплого отцовского отношения с сыном Леонидом, Хрущев постоянно пытался найти себе других сыновей. Он был очень склонен к фаворитизму. Он постоянно пытался найти себе молодых подвижников, где бы он бы не работал. Вся его история – это поиск семьи, поиск смысла, поиск сына и постоянное разочарование. А если Хрущев не мог найти себе вот опору в ком-то конкретном, он находил ее себе в массовом таком, в массовой семье. 1928. Yusovka. He just breezed in. His wild eyes swept past a surprised Nina, who had met him on the threshold. Without saying a word, he ran to the kitchen and drank half a bottle of vodka. He poured the remains over his face and down his clothes. A few minutes later, there was a knock at the door. Young men in Mufti were looking for Nikita Khrushchev. Nina had no time to say anything before her husband burst into the living room. He was too weak to stand and was laughing and hiccuping loudly. 
Seeing the strangers, Khrushchev brightened up even more. He offered them drinks and then started an indecent chastushka with a stupid voice. Nina snapped her fingers. She had never seen Nikita so drunk before. The strangers had a laugh and left. When the door closed behind them, Khrushchev sighed with relief and fell on the sofa, drained of all his strength. It was the end of the 20th year. Lenin's former comrades created a tough opposition to the power of the newly made General Secretary Stalin. And under the leader's order, the security service employees started to look for enemies in the party. The actual Donetsk didn't escape the purges, at that time the town of Yuzovka. In 1928, at a meeting of the local party activists, all the participants were arrested on suspicion of conspiracy against Stalin. It's quite possible that Khrushchev knew something. Maybe somebody told him about the plans of the security service. But he didn't attend that meeting and had put on the drunken act at home. This funny undertaking saved Khrushchev's life. He was so convincing as a drunken fool that the young men in Mufti didn't suspect anything. Khrushchev played the fool again, convinced that he'd found a great disguise. The more he played the fool, the more he moved up the party ladder, edging ever closer to Stalin. But then the time came when he had to wear this fool's mask as his true face. It became his curse. 1930, Moscow. They studied together at Moscow Industrial Academy. Nikita, attentive and polite, saw Nadeshda home again and again. He always tried to be beside this modest and silent girl because he knew that she was the wife of the comrade Stalin. Khrushchev didn't give anything away, but he took the opportunity to praise the leader's party policy before Nadeshta. Above all, this modest party organizer wanted to be observed, and if he was lucky, he wanted to be signed. His heart leapt. This was it. After having some doubts, he expressed thanks to them for his invitation. The Kremlin's corridors were safeguarded. Nadezhda opened the door with her own key. Tatka, Tatka. This was the name Stalin gave to his wife when they were at home. He heard about a prospective party member, Khrushchev, from Nadezhda, and also from his faithful assistant, Kaganovich. It was the beginning of the 30th year. The old party members, Leninists, headed by Trotsky, created a tough opposition, and the position of the general secretary became increasingly precarious. He needed devoted people, and Stalin gave heed to Khrushchev. Stalin laughed and made fun at the table. While pouring wine, he entertained with the finest Georgian dishes the emotionally strained Khrushchev felt weak. No, Nikitka, Khrushchev swapped recipes. Stalin kept a close watch on his guests.
Хручук был как, на тот случай первый. Это послушный исполнитель. Абсолютно надежный послушный исполнитель. И, во-вторых, Сталину импонировала та народность и тот, я бы сказал, та непосредственность, с которой Хрущев общался с массами. То есть как руководитель при всей своей и невысокой образованности, и, может быть, недостаточно широком кругозоре, Хрущев вместе с тем воплощал в себе, ну, я бы сказал, такие лучшие черты народного характера. Не лез за словом в карман, всегда умел отшутиться, всегда умел как-то ярко и образно подать, порой достаточно сложные там какие-то партийные построения. After the first meeting with Stalin, Khrushchev quickly advanced up the ladder, soon becoming the leader of the district committee of party. Over the years, he went on to become the head of the whole party organization in Moscow. It was a meteoric rise. But the higher he rose, the higher the price of his success. He called on his assistant and close friend, Boris Trevis. The room was a mess, papers and letters thrown about, and three men were examining a document. Oh, товарищ Хрущев. Отлично. Подпишите, пожалуйста. Вот здесь. He pretended to examine the document. Trevis looked at him appealingly. The enemy of the people. Should he sign it? Khrushchev knew Trevis respected him. What sort of an enemy was he? What if he didn't sign it? They would be accomplices. Khrushchev was terrified. He closed his eyes and signed the document. Сталин подбирал людей, где было за что зацепиться в биографии, понимая, что манипулировать ими легче. И уж они-то будут работать не на страх, а, так сказать, ну, и за страх, и за совесть. Khrushchev was walking down the prison corridor. He was the secretary of the district committee and was in charge of personally inspecting the actions of the investigatory powers. Somebody called him. He looked closely at the heavily bearded prisoner. It was Boris Trevis. Khrushchev was terrified and quickened his step. Shouts rang out behind him. Khrushchev felt sick. What was he guilty of? Why must he bear such humiliations? There was only one thing to do. Forget about it. As time passed, he grew accustomed to signing the lists of the victims of political repression without hesitation. And he consoled himself again and again. Soon, all the enemies would be exterminated and all his troubles would soon be over. He decided not to risk his position. Because the higher party gave him benefits he could never have dreamed of. But he felt guilty being part of the high-ranking apartment. This is the famous house on the riverfront. Right here, the Khrushchev settled down in a four-room apartment. It's a real Soviet paradise. It had an oak parquet floor, marble bathrooms and ceilings painted by artists from the Hermitage Museum. It also had a clinic, a cinema and a kindergarten. The inhabitants ate in the dining hall free of charge. They could pay with special coupons. If there was communism in the Soviet Union, it existed here. Khrushchev thought that his life was in good shape. The housekeeping and the children were in Nina's safe hands. He was in a good professional standing with excellent prospects. So the criminal case that landed on his table, addressed to Nikita Khrushchev, came out of the blue. A band of robbers were arrested. And this band includes Leonid Khrushchev, his son. His blood ran cold. 
They could report this to Stalin and it would be the end of his career. Khrushchev decided to confess and promise his deep devotion to the leader. He entered Stalin's office. The leader looked at him. Nikita Sergeevich understood that the case was already reported to him. He didn't know what to say. The silence was deafening. And suddenly, Stalin, by accident or not, dropped his papers. Nikita blushed. His head was ringing. He threw himself at the leader's legs, picked up the papers and handed them over. Stalin looked at him. Nikita felt that the tension in the office was lifted. The master had forgiven him. Nothing threatens Nikita. Leaving the office, he looked in the mirror and saw the full smiling face with spaniel eyes. He didn't even think of his son. Nikita Sergeevich will never forget that visit to the leader. Feelings of weakness rose again. He will always be afraid of Stalin and hate him for that fear. For that nasty tinge of humiliation and necessity to always play the fool. If only he could survive and not lose what he already had. He failed to close his son's case. But the hearings were held behind closed doors. The members of the band received the ultimate penalty. Execution. Leonid was involved in this case as a witness. But Stalin decided that Khrushchev should not be allowed to get away with this. In a few months, Khrushchev got the position of the first secretary of the Communist Party of Ukraine. Anyone would consider this a real gift. But Nikita Sergeevich understood that he was exiled from the Kremlin. It was a bad omen. When leaving for Kiev, Khrushchev was determined to win back Stalin's favor at any cost. And with this in mind, he flooded the Ukraine with blood. For the next 11 years, he remained in the Ukraine. There, Khrushchev learned to dance with his famous hopak, to sing the Ukrainian folk songs in a terrible mixed Russian-Ukrainian dialect, and to kill millions of people. Being away from Moscow, he showed his true nature, and that terrified the whole country. After Khrushchev's arrival in Kiev, the following encoded text was sent to the Politburo of the Central Committee in Moscow. Dear Losiv Vissarionovich, every month the Ukraine suffers from 17 to 18,000 victims of the political repression. But Moscow insists that it shouldn't be more than two or 3,000. I ask you to take measures. And the measures were taken. Khrushchev was authorized to shoot more. The party meeting had been going on for four hours. The deputy chairman of the Venitsa District Executive Committee, Kozis, while sitting in the hall, felt that he could hardly keep his eyes open because of the monotonous speech. He tried to stay awake, but couldn't. On hearing Comrade Stalin's name, the sleepy Kozis jumped up and began to clap loudly. The agents of the People's Commissariat for Internal Affairs, NKVD, were behind him. They took away the spy and the enemy of the people. Khrushchev was informed about the incident.
He ordered to find Cossus's secret accomplices, those who had worked or had dealt with him on personal or public matters, and to exterminate the hedge enemies, such as Cossus. 35,000 people were subjected to repression in Venitsa alone in 1938. Stalin was satisfied. In 1941, at the beginning of the war, he appointed Khrushchev as a member of the War Council as a sign of gratitude. Khrushchev couldn't believe it. Nikita Sergeevich was triumphant. But he didn't know what would later happen to him that would threaten not only his career, but also his life. In 1943, Koibyshev, the soldiers filled the hospital yard. Who were the most accurate shooters, aviators or sailors? They emptied a bottle of vodka. A sailor put the bottle on his head. A pilot took aim and shot. The sailor silently fell to the ground. Blood ran down his forehead. Leonid sobered up in a flash. One word ran through his head. Tribunal. The news struck Khrushchev. His son Leonia must be executed. But he is so young. He hadn't done anything for his son. No warm words nor any parental care. Tears choked Nikita Sergeevich. He had betrayed Frosia and didn't protect their son. But he can save him. He marched into the leader's office to explain. He looked at Stalin's eyes and realized that there was no hope. But Khrushchev knew what he had to do. He dropped down on his knees with a beatific smile and bitter tears and began to creep up to Stalin. The leader looked daggers at him. He could barely stand. He was engulfed by a peculiar feeling of emptiness, just like something had burst inside him. Stalin apologized. Nothing else mattered. The most essential thing is that he managed to save Leonia. Now he could go to the front and come back a hero. And when the war is over, they will meet and he will make amends. Leonia will apologize to him. Stricken by grief, he sat in a shelter next to Major Zamorin, his son's comrade. Khrushchev couldn't believe what he was hearing. Leonia didn't return from the last flight operation. Nothing could be mended now. There is nobody to whom he could say the sincere parental words that he was holding back all these years. Leonid Khrushchev died a hero's death. Khrushchev couldn't even cry. There was a stabbing pain in his temples and he couldn't breathe. A terrible thought flitted across his mind. Leonia was punished for the father's sins, for the shooting of innocent people, for arresting innocent families, and for making children orphans. And for what? Why did he kowtow to Stalin? To survive in the repression hell. But now he, Nikita, is still alive and Leonia is dead. His son is dead, but Stalin is alive. He was determined to exterminate Stalin. While wearing the fool's mask, he will study the enemy's habits and wait for a suitable moment and strike. 1953. The Stalin's traditional dinner is in full swing. 
Last time, the gatherings were held every day, or more exactly, every night. They gathered at 11 in the evening and left just before dawn. They were all extremely tired with this regime. But Stalin, who was suffering from insomnia, wouldn't let his retinue go. Beria played the usual role of a toastmaster and forced the guests to eat and drink. Stalin himself didn't touch the food. He was suspicious of being poisoned. He saw enemies everywhere. Ну что, товарищи, расстреляем Никиту или пусть танцует? He danced. Everyone laughed at his clumsiness and didn't suspect what he was thinking of. He knew the time was close. He had to keep calm and kill Stalin. Танцуй, Никита. Best of all, by Beria's hands. I must consider everything carefully. I must remove Beria. Malenkov and Molotov don't have to be killed. It is enough to deprive them of their high office. He performed his last move, stepped forward and bowed. It began with the physician's case. Stalin received a denunciation. The Leningrad physician, Lydia Timoshuk, informed him that the group of court physicians is about to revolt. Their aim is to poison the devoted members of the Politburo and Comrade Stalin. The next day, the Soviet special services declared a hunt for miscreants wearing a white uniform. Khrushchev understood it was time. He convinced the suspicious barrier that Stalin must sign the order of his arrest. That would do the job. Then he could move aside and observe. Khrushchev saw Beria removing Stalin's entourage and he replaced them with his devoted people. Firstly, the physicians, then the household servants, and lastly, the leader himself. He had prepared for him a terrible death using a virulent poison made in the secret laboratory of NKVD. Это не просто отравление, отравление было Как говорится, по всем направлениям кровоизлияние было настолько страшным, что когда вскрыли желудок Сталина, то все было как будто посечено дробью. Как будто вот взяли в желудок внутри и выстрелили из дробовика. Все, вот такие кровяные пятнышки, такие кровоизлияния, все, желудок весь кровоизлияние, все, весь кишечник кровоизлияние, все полностью, все, весь организм. Stalin's funeral was immortalized in this unique 1953 film footage. This is Lavrenti Beria. He is the first among the people carrying the leader's coffin. Nikita Khrushchev is just behind. He saw how confidently Lavrenti Pavlovich behaved, how he made the orders. Beria was sure that he was the successor, being unaware that the worst was still to come, and the full Khrushchev would strike the last blow. Beria didn't know that at the time Khrushchev had gathered his friends, Generals Zhukov Batitsky and Moskalenko, under the veil of military maneuvers. He rounded up support from Malenkov, Molotov, Kaganovich. They burst into Beria's office and arrested him without explanation. The former chief of NKVD was executed at Lubyanka. Khrushchev became leader of the country. He combined the position of the first secretary of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union with the position of chief of the Council of Ministers, having taken it from Malenkov. After that, he became the absolute authority. He was sure that he had taken vengeance and won a victory. And now, at last, everything would be okay. He hadn't realized that the fool's mask that he was wearing for years 
had become his true nature. The General Secretary's tragedy was that on his way to leadership, he was not learning how to lead the country, but how to be a fool. The reception on the occasion of the Soviet leader's visit to the United States of America was in full swing. All the American movie stars were there. Marilyn Monroe, Harry Copper, and Frank Sinatra. On the Soviet side, Nikita Khrushchev and his wife, Nina Petrovna, and a few ambassadors. The delegation watched the new blockbuster, Can Can. And now Nikita Khrushchev commented in his usual manner about what he had watched. His indignation had no limits. Why did the actresses shamelessly kick their legs and show their underclothes? How could anyone like it? Just look at this. How? In order to make it more convincing, he pulled up his coat and danced something like a can-can. The Americans were shocked. They had never seen something like that before. Once again, he'd become the fool. Till the end, he accused Losif Stalin, on whom he continued to take vengeance even after his death. Thirty-first of October, 1961, at 6 p.m., the militia blocked Red Square. And as night fell, the searchlights illuminated a plot behind the mausoleum where Stalin would be reburied. The grave was dug at 9 o'clock in the evening. And late into the night, the eight officers carried Stalin's body out of the mausoleum and buried him near the Kremlin's wall. The next morning, only Lenin's body lay in the mausoleum. Stalin was not there. When, due to the Khrushchev's reformatory activities, the people in the USSR were on the brink of war, the former comrades of the general secretary removed Khrushchev. Since then, he lived in the camp his name disappeared from the pages of the Great Soviet Encyclopedia. 1971, the country celebrated the Day of Cosmonautics. The modest pensioner Nikita Khrushchev was watching again and again the famous frames. He remembered that day very well. What they need, Gagarin was advancing along a red carpet to report about the first human spaceflight. But something was missing in the picture. If one looked closely, he could see a little spot next to Gagarin. And it's not a faulty tape. That day, they were advancing side by side, two happy conquerors. The first cosmonaut and the first man of the best country in the world. Later, Khrushchev's picture disappeared even from the film negative. His face was erased in order to erase his name from the national remembrance forever. He should not become a ruler, and he would never become a tyrant. The only prophecy attributed to a young boy named Joseph Djugashvili was accidental death in young childhood. But owing to unbelievable circumstances, he survived. As gratitude to God for his salvation, he graduated from a religious school and entered a theological seminary. He planned to be a priest until he met a man who changed his life. After that meeting, he changed his name and date of birth.
he started to lead a double life. Soon the world would know him under the name of Stalin, literally meaning a man made of steel, a cruel ruler deprived of emotions and feelings. Only a few friends would remember the old Joseph, a timid and shy boy from the town of Gori. What happened to that boy after the tragic accident in Gori? Who made him change? And why did a shy seminarist turn into a bloody murderer and despot? You will uncover the secrets of Joseph Jugashvili, the secrets which, if disclosed, could lead to the death sentence. You will see two horoscopes of Joseph Stalin and hear a sensational discovery made by astrologists based on the ruler's death mask. Тот образ вождя, который нам внушали с детства, этой маской сразу разрушается. It happened in 1890 in a small town of Gori in Georgia. A choir of boys were singing a canticle on the street. A phaeton was approaching. Suddenly, the horse jerked at its reins and neighed. It happened so quickly that the children and their teacher didn't understand what was going on. The horse galloped towards the singing boys. They all ran away, except for 12-year-old Soso. The horse kicked Soso over. Soso appeared to be dead. If the horse had kicked Soso in the head, it could have changed the history of the Soviet Union forever. The 12-year-old could have died under the Phaeton's wheels, or he could have died of smallpox when he was five. He could have died before his first birthday, just like his brothers. But he was destined to live a long life. For a small Georgian boy, Gori was a godforsaken town, the son of a shoemaker and a laundress. He would go on to become the leader of the largest country on earth. He would be known to the world as Joseph Stalin. In 1932, Soviet newspapers remembered that accident in Gori and, furthermore, published an interview with Stalin's mother. In that interview, she told of how her child Soso had been a very sickly, timid boy. Finally, she admitted it would have been better if he'd become a priest. Stalin could hardly contain his anger. It took him 30 years to gain absolute power. For 10 years, he held power in his hands, but was surrounded by enemies who raked through his past, trying to find some compromising information that would destroy him. But they would fail. The same day, the Politburo of the Central Committee, governing body of the Communist Party, received an angry letter saying, avoid any new interviews with my mother and any other unnecessary publicity into our newspapers. Spare me those scoundrels search for sensations. Until Stalin's death, his official biography contained only three phrases. Born in Gori, commenced revolutionary fight at the age of 15, headed the party and the state after Lenin's death. Stalin suppressed any attempts to shed light on his youth. What was the people's father hiding? A strong kick, no internal damages. A doctor prescribed rest and a good diet. Ekaterina Jugashvili, or Keke, as she was known by her neighbors and relatives, shed bitter tears over her son. How could her only son die from a horse kick? Keke leant over the boy. God, why do you make him suffer so? 
A doctor said, good diet. Where do I get the money? My husband will come soon, drunk and impoverished. Besso, the shoemaker, always spends everything he earns in the pub. He doesn't care about his crippled son. Once the kid almost died because of his father. The tragedy happened when Joseph had just celebrated his sixth birthday. Keke worked as a laundress at the house of a wealthy wine merchant. From morning till night, she rinsed linen in the ice-cold waters of Kura, and at night, she darned the merchant's shirts. Her husband, Visarian, Besso, made shirts during the day and in the evening, wasted his money in the pub. Sosa was left alone and begged God not to allow night to return. For at around midnight every night, his father would come back from the pub and all hell would break out. However, that night, Visarian came earlier than usual. His wife put supper on the table and quickly returned to her sewing work. This made her husband angry. How humiliating. She should stand at his side while he is eating. Visarian rushed over to his wife and started beating her. Soso, in an attempt to protect his mother, rushed over to his father. But his father grabbed him by the collar and threw him to the floor before kicking him hard. Hearing Keke's awful cries, the neighbors rushed over and tied the hooligan up. Two weeks later, Soso found blood in his urine. The father had damaged his kidney. Visarion Jugashvili drank hard. He often came home without his belt, the last thing for a Georgian to do. What was going on in his soul? What grief was he trying to drown in wine? Why did he vent his spleen upon his only son and wife? No one will ever know. In an attempt to explain those fits of anger, some biographers of Stalin have suggested that Besso the shoemaker took revenge on his wife and hated his son because he was not the real father. Since Stalin's death, several possible real fathers have come to light. However, only two of them were the focus of rumor. Ayakov Ignatashvili was a rich wine merchant. Keke worked for him. He took pity on the mother and son and often helped them with money and food. And later, he paid for Soso's studies at the Gori Theological School. This financial support is confirmed in the memoirs of Stalin's mother. They were found recently in the state archives of Georgia. That generosity can hardly be deemed a confirmation of a relationship between the master and his laundress. There is evidence that Ayakov Ignatashvili was just a very kind and sentimental person. He did not have his own children, and that's why he helped the children of others. But humans always remain human. There were so-called well-wishers in Gori who told Visarian that the master of charity had other motives. And he tormented his wife with jealousy. Young Joseph heard it all. What was he able to understand at the time? The older he became, the more contempt he felt towards his mother. Что касается матери Сталина, потому как Сталин к ней относился, можно предположить, что он считал себя действительно ублюдком, бастардом. Сами по себе слухи о том, что он незаконно рожден, его, конечно, травмировали. Детскую, юношескую психику такие вещи очень сильно травмировали. There is evidence from one of Stalin's contemporaries that once, during a conversation, he called his mother a whore. Was this bitter conclusion based on his childhood experience? It's unlikely. 
Usually, people keep such thoughts to themselves, especially lonely, selfish people like Stalin. It means that this confession, which seemed so sincere, was for some reason beneficial. But why? He wanted those rumors about it. A supposition that Stalin's real father was a well-known Russian traveler named Prezhevalsky was on everybody's lips. Back then, people could be wiped off the face of the earth for being rude about Stalin. It looks as though Stalin wanted to turn those rumors to his benefit. The Tsar of the huge empire, with Russians as the dominating nation, preferred that his father be an outstanding Russian scientist than a Georgian drunk. Except for the likeness in appearance, there are no other confirmations that Prezhevalsky was Stalin's father. Stalin's temper does not leave any room for doubt. Besso the irresolute, revengeful, despotic shoemaker can be clearly seen in Stalin. He hated his father and was ashamed of him. But with age, he became increasingly like his father. The day the boy was hit by a phaeton, his mother felt shock. She urgently needed money. She went to the man who never helped her, to Ignatashvili, the merchant. He expressed sympathy for her and generously gave her money to buy medicines and food for the child. Keke prudently divided the money into several portions and hid them so that her drunkard husband could not find them. Next day, she saw that the hiding place had been discovered and that the money was gone. That evening, Besso, drunk as usual, returned home. His wife rushed over to him and asked where the money was. Besso's eyes became bloodshot. He demanded to know where she had got the money. Keke had to confess. He behaved as though he'd caught her cheating. Besso rushed at her. Soso grabbed a knife and threw it at his father's back. But he missed. He assumed his father would kill him. But instead, Besso took the knife and asked, Could you really kill me, son? And in his eyes, he read, Yes. Several years later, a book by a Georgian writer Kazbeki titled Patricide would get into Joseph's hand. One of the book's heroes, a noble robber and people's venger, would leave a lasting impression. His name was Koba. Later, a young revolutionary Joseph Jugashvili would take it as his nickname. Soso will never forget the day when he laid his hands on his father. He felt a sense of satisfaction. Those offenses could not be forgiven. They needed to be avenged. A single occurrence at the theological school where he studied convinced him that this conclusion was right. Coming soon, Stalin's hidden defect why didn't he take his shoes off in the presence of strangers? A bloody revenge upon a betrayer friend. How an executioner was born. Gurdjieff, the occultist. A life-changing prophecy for a theological school student, Stalin. Why did Stalin change his date of birth? An unbelievable discovery using a death mask. Pius Keke believed that becoming a priest would be the most worthy career for her only son. When Soso entered the Gori Theological School, she was overjoyed. She didn't realize that Joseph had only chosen to become a priest to annoy his father. 
Vissarion wanted Soso to become a shoemaker because he believed he was stupid. On hearing this, nine-year-old Soso went crazy and resolved to prove that he had talent. He would get a degree and become a priest. He would become a metropolitan and then a patriarch. His father would regret what he had said. Soso became a clever, diligent student. Teachers said only good things about him. This boosted his self-esteem. Initially unsociable and taciturn, he began to take part in school activities and soon he made a real friend. Soso loved him with all his heart. He had never had any friends. He was glad that finally there was someone to talk to and to share his thoughts. It was to this boy that Soso revealed his big secret. He did not know yet what betrayal meant. On summer days, senior students were allowed to go to the river to swim, accompanied by a teacher. The 13-year-old boys splashed around, but only Soso stayed on the bank. He refused to swim and wouldn't even walk barefoot in the sand along the bank. It was not for the first time, and now his schoolmates refused to believe that he was just afraid of catching cold they decided to find out why Soso had not taken his shoes off. Один из сверстников, видя, что Иосиф Джугашвили с неохотой снимает обувь, как-то над ним слегка пошутил, говорит: "Ты что, у тебя там скрывается дьявольская копытца?" Soso stiffened. Who said that? He could not believe his ears. He recognized the voice of his friend. Let's take his shoes off. You'll see it with your own eyes. Soso's reaction slowed down. This psychological feature of stiffening in critical situations first manifested itself during the accident with the phaeton. All the children scattered in different directions. Joseph was so scared he couldn't move. As a result, he was severely injured. He had the same reaction in June of 1941. The news that the war had broken out shocked Stalin so much that he became utterly speechless and hid himself away at his summer house. Molotov had to announce a general mobilization. Only 10 days later, Stalin, emaciated and wizened, would find the strength to make a speech to his people. He couldn't move. Fear had paralyzed his will. His schoolmates knocked him to the ground and started to take off his shoes. He fought back, but it was an uneven confrontation. Fortunately, the teacher stepped in. Joseph was left alone. He wiped away the tears of humiliation while his former friend was jeering at him, just like the others. Devil, we will bring you out into the open. Stalin's medical card says, webbing of fingers on left foot. The nature of that mutilation is unknown. It may be the consequence of the accident with the phaeton, since witnesses said the phaeton ran over the boy's feet. On the other hand, it may be a congenital defect, which is common for children of alcoholics. This defect has a very unpleasant name, Devil's Hoof. Soso felt shy because of it and hid the defect. The only person to whom Soso entrusted his secret was that boy who organized the persecution on the riverbank. They were in the bathhouse and Joseph showed him the mutilation. He was Soso's friend and promised him to keep it a secret. In the end, he betrayed him and tried to dishonor him in front of the others. That accident changed his attitude towards people for the rest of his life. Trust no one, since even a friend may betray you. He never made another friend.
There were some acquaintances whom he used. There were comrades. But he carefully locked all his secrets and personal worries deep inside his soul. After the accident, Sosso longed for revenge. The betrayer must regret what he had done. Joseph Jugashvili did not forgive offenses and humiliations. After the incident, Sosso became friends with the toughest boy in the school, whose name was Zaradza. Several months later, Zaradza, on Sosso's order, attacked the betrayer. Sosso watched the boys fight, but did not join in. He felt satisfaction watching his one-time friend writhing in pain, especially when he started begging for mercy. He felt power over another human being for the first time. He was the only one who could decide whether the offender should live or die. A thought flickered through his head. The betrayer should die. The victim wheezed and choked with blood. Suddenly, Joseph saw a teacher running to them and told Zaredze to stop the execution. After the beating, the victim was sent to hospital where doctors claimed that it was pure chance that the boy had survived. The incident was reviewed by the administrative board of the school. Joseph was scared since punishment looked inevitable. In the end, the hired executioner, Zaradze, was expelled and Soso was left alone. After all, he was the best student and had not actually taken part in the violence. When everything was over, Joseph breathed a sigh of relief. He realized that revenge should be carried out by others. It was not so sweet, but much safer. Many years later, he would use this principle to build a powerful machinery of repression. The effect would be astonishing. For a long time after dethronement of the personality cult, People would say, the blood of millions is on the hands of Eshov, Beria and others. And Stalin, as a kind of czar, did not know anything, and hence was not guilty. Joseph graduated from the theological school with honors. He passed with an excellent Mark 10 out of 12 examination disciplines. The diploma allowed him to continue studies at the Tiflis Theological Seminary. Furthermore, as the best graduate, Joseph Jugashvili was exempt from paying for his education and the government paid for it. His mother was happy. Her dream had come true. Her son would make a career in the church and then everything in his life would be perfect. Let God give her the chance to stay alive till that moment Joseph listened to his mother and thought of the event that had shattered his belief in God. He couldn't tell Keke about that because he himself was afraid to admit it. But the recollection of that event did not leave him. When he was in the second form at school, he and his friends saw a public execution for the first time. Their teacher had taken them there to show where sinners end their days at the gibbet. But the 12-year-old teenagers were depressed by what they saw. Their minds could not match the commandment do not kill, which was preached at school with the execution of two peasants. Especially as during one of the executions, a rope broke. At that moment, Soso breathed a sigh of relief there is an unwritten rule that no one could be executed twice. But then he looked on with astonishment. The rope was replaced. The priest on the scaffold turned away indifferently and the peasant was hanged. When the shock was over, Soso believed that he had been fooled at the theological school. In real life, common people and even priests breach God's commandments. After graduation, he reached a crossroads. 
he longed to leave Gori and enter to a big, wide world in order to change his fate. But he was eaten up with doubt. He did not see why he should have to enter the church. He had nothing to prove to his father any longer. Several years had passed since Vasarian Jugashvili was killed for his debts in the pub. Should he become a seminary student for the sake of the mother? She would be glad. She believed that sooner or later, her son would make his way to the top of the church hierarchy. She didn't ask whether his faith was strong or whether he was worthy of such a reward. Suddenly, Joseph understood. It was not faith that mattered, but power. He would be worshiped. He would be respected. He could remit sins or impose punishments. He would be like a god on earth. As for his doubts, should it not be Seminary's job to strengthen his belief in God? He suffered. Everything turned out to be different from what he expected it to be. The strictest regime was established at the Seminary. Endless church services, studies, prayers, a two-hour walk around the town, and prayers again. At 10 in the evening, candles were put out and the Seminary was plunged into a deep sleep. Time after time, Joseph regretted his decision to continue his studies. In that semi-prison atmosphere, dreams about his forthcoming career and his future grandeur looked unrealistic. He felt like an innocent prisoner. He was 17 and in despair. Recently, he read a book by Darwin, Origin of Species, and made the final conclusion that they were deceived at the seminary. God did not exist. But what did exist? What should he believe in and strive for? His eyes were opened when a student friend from a senior course showed him a shabby book titled Revolutionary's Catechism, saying it contained the answer to Joseph's questions. However, he warned that the book was forbidden and one could be expelled or even put into jail for having it. Marxism was spreading over Russia and found a fertile ground in the minds of students who doubted their faith. Service to a new messiah. The hard-working people who were full of self-sacrifice. They compared themselves to the early Christians. Joseph felt that he had found his calling. At last, he had a goal and had found comrades who shared the same ideals. Together, they started attending meetings of an illegal Marxist group. He gave up his studies, stayed late in town, came home late, and spent hours in jail. Even his mother's persuasions did not help. She came to see her son, but found him in jail. When she asked why he was there, he said, for the book that showed how to overthrow the Tsar. She was terrified and begged him to give up his rebellious thoughts. His soul was torn between pity and anger towards her. There was no point in explaining as she would not understand. Keke looked at her son and did not recognize him. However, she felt that her precious son had gone down a wrong and dangerous road which she couldn't understand. But where did he get that confidence and that cold stare? These were the eyes of a man who knows what he wants. She did not know that Joseph had already met a person who would change his life forever. At the meetings of the Marxist group, he found a new friend, a senior student at the same seminary, George Georgiev, who became a world-renowned philosopher, occultist, and astrologist. When he attended meetings, discussions about the forthcoming revolution always turned to mystical matters. 
что это, в общем-то, ну, вот эта тяга к оккультным каким-то ритуалам магическим, скорее черно-магическим, среди э, пламенных революционеров и большевиков, к сожалению, была распространена под маской материалистов, атеистов и борцов с этим самым, с религиозным сознанием, они занимались чуть ли не магическими ритуалами. Gurdjieff possessed ancient magical knowledge. He showed his comrades some rituals, taught the fundamentals of astrology and even predicted the future. It was Gurdjieff who told Stalin you will become a great man and reign over millions of people. But if you want this, you will need to find your own path. He read this as meaning that the revolutionary struggle would bring him greatness. Koba left the seminary. He had nothing more to do there. He continued to attend the meetings of the Marxist group and found a regular job at the Tiflis Observatory. At that time, the observatory was not equipped with self-recording devices and movement of celestial bodies was recorded manually during the day and at night. Koba's shift fell on December the 31st, 1899, the beginning of the 20th century, in which he was destined to play the most important historical figure on Earth. Nobody will ever know whether it was mere chance that Koba's shift had fallen on New Year's Eve 1900 and what he spoke to the stars about. But one thing is clear, he knew for sure that the stars governed human fate. Gurdjieff convinced him of that. We can only assume that it was that night at the beginning of a new century when looking at the stars and trying to understand their path that Joseph understood what Gurdjieff had meant by his words. A new way which Joseph had to choose and which would lead him to the summit of power, this was nothing more than a new horoscope. Changing the year of someone's birth could alter their whole life. Some researchers assume that it was Gurdjieff who chose a new date of birth for Stalin. There is no evidence to confirm this, but modern astrologists say that his horoscope was made by a highly qualified professional for a person who longed for unlimited power. For instance, the choice of December the 21st instead of December the 18th is more than fortunate for a future ruler. По древним календарям это день самой длинной ночи самого короткого дня когда наиболее активны темные силы. И когда появляется герой, который побеждает тьму. That's because a hero vested with huge power could be born on December the 21st and never on December the 18th, as Stalin had. В этом гороскопе, в его личном гороскопе, не было власти. Для этого нужно было сделать нечто другое, что он и сделал. И власть появилась. Pavel Glober helped us to match the meaning of positions of the Sun, the Moon and Mars in the Stalin's first and second horoscopes. Here are the results. The horoscope of the person born on December the 18th, 1878, Joseph Jugashvili date of birth, is that of a powerless and selfish person with many enemies. Maniacally stubborn, predisposed to brain diseases and poor health. In contrast to that, the person born on December the 21st, 1879 was the absolute opposite. He was destined to succeed in all his undertakings, would have glory and power and good health. He was straightforward, but would come to power through unkind means. Stalin publicly announced his new date of birth, but only 20 years after his first contact with the astrologist.
Why did he spend 20 years working his way to the top under the original unflattering horoscope? Pavel Glober believes that as a mystic, Stalin believed he had to wait for the right moment when a new horoscope would become a vital necessity. And that moment came on April the 3rd, 1922. It was the date of the party convention which had to make a final decision whether Stalin would become the ruler of the state. Его сознательное изменение даты рождения и включение нового гороскопа для него был не просто так, а некий магический акт, на который он пошел сознательно, сделал это на съезде, меняет свою анкету, он зачеркивает свою дату, это сохранился, этот вот листок, где это все впервые он делает, потому что до этого в анкетах он фигурирует 1878 года. The years of birth clearly show that Joseph Dugashvili chose the new horoscope only when he became Stalin. The second horoscope says that year of birth to be 1879. Кот всегда считался по восточному календарю, это всегда очень хитрый и коварный, э, э, коварное существо, которое всегда действует из-под тяжка. Caution, careful consideration, guile and meanness. These are the traits which Stalin was known for. In the first horoscope, his year of birth was 1878, the year of the tiger. A person born in this year is characterized by ardor, fervor, enthusiasm, and recklessness. Koba was exactly like that when he started his ascent to power. Но ничего больше, скажем, умения и показателей на то, чтобы добиться высшего положения в обществе, в этом гороскопе нет. Сильная личность. Действительно такой идущий на крайние меры, но с ограниченными вот возможностями. Дата его рождения, вот та самая дата, которую он родился 18 декабря, это дата сильного человека, сильной личности. Но скорее всего человек, который занимается террористической деятельностью, либо бандита, уголовника. That was the horoscope under which Stalin, then known as Koba, began his road to absolute power. He firstly became a member of the Tiflis Committee of the Russian Social Democratic Labour Party and organized Marxist meetings and demonstrations of workers in Tiflis and Batumi. Those demonstrations were broken up by the police and blood was shed. Koba was shocked. Although it was not the first time that he'd seen death, although back then it had been the death of his comrades at the hands of hostile strangers. Koba believed in a death for a death. The Caucasus choked with blood. Staying in immigration, Lenin was satisfied. We may say that open revolutionary movement has begun in the Caucasus. It was at that time that Lenin first reported about Koba, a reliable leader of the revolutionary underground in Georgia. That was the beginning of his career. And then there were the things that Stalin, the ruler, feared to think about until the end of his life. Things which, if disclosed, could deprive him of the most precious thing in his life, power. That is why he would thoroughly cover up any tracks and destroy any person who got in his way. Lenin and other leaders in immigration took every opportunity to acquire money. They organized armed robberies of banks and of capitalists. In the revolutionary business slang, it was called an ex, expropriation. However, it was risky for the leaders to use their own hands. Besides, there was no need as long as there were reliable comrades in Russia. Koba eagerly tackled the job. He made his friends leaders of the gang. His childhood friend Simon Terpetrosian, aka Camo, and seminary mate Alexander Zvanidze. Over several weeks, the armed gang robbed many special-purpose teams of the state bank with dozens of victims. 
but Lenin's reserves ran to hundreds of thousands of rubles. Only Kamo and Svanidze knew that those bloody exes were organized by Koba. That knowledge would cost them dearly in the future. Lenin learned about that from Koba and appreciated the help of a comrade from the Caucasus. Since then, Koba's career went uphill. At the same time, Koba came to the attention of the police. He was arrested and put into a cell with criminals. For the police, he was just another criminal. However, his cellmates saw that he was different. They thought that he might be a political leader. Maybe he fought against the Tsar. He should therefore be shown a lesson. Koba might be beaten to death, but when jail guards started beating the criminals, Koba acted in an unexpected way. He grabbed a weapon and started protecting his cellmates. Now it looked like a riot against jail abuse of power with Koba as the leader of the riot. At first, the criminals couldn't understand what had happened. Then he was exiled to Siberia, but escaped after two years. He returned back to Tiflis, where the police knew him by sight. Was it so difficult for the police to arrest Koba and send him to the place from which nobody could run away? It's incredible. He managed to remain in hiding for four years. The archives of the former gendarme department kept three reports about Jugashvili's arrests. He was arrested, but then released. He had organized bloody robberies, was a jailbreaker, a man outside the law with a forged passport. Why? There is only one explanation. Koba knew how to strike a deal not only with criminals, but with the secret political police as well. In other words, he cooperated with the police in exchange for his personal freedom. To be more precise, he betrayed his comrades. No direct evidence has been found as yet, which may be the reason why Stalin prohibited anyone rummaging through his past. We only know that living in hiding was the happiest and unhappiest time of his private life. During those four years, he met and lost his first love. Now they both were members of the Russian Social Democratic Labour Party, revolutionary underground comrades. It was at his comrade's house that Koba saw the younger sister of his comrade. He was shocked. The girl's resemblance to his mother was striking. It was no surprise that her name was Ekaterina Keke. It could not be otherwise. He was 25 and a tough revolutionary who had been through jail and exile. But beside that 19-year-old girl, he felt like young Soso again. He was so shy and tried hard to hide his passion for Cato. Finally, he asked her to marry him. Cato agreed. She was brought up in the Caucasian traditions and remembered the words of her deceased mother. Your husband is not the one who conquers you, but the one to whom you submit. The newlywed settled at Svanidze's house. Kato's sister Maria often came to visit her, and Koba's underground comrade, Simon Terpatrosian, often visited. Alexander Svanidze and his wife always kept an open table and eagerly invited Koba, Kato, and their guests over. The men drank wine, joked, and quietly discussed their revolutionary plans. The women did not interfere and had their own conversations. These were the good times. Everybody was young and happy. The only blot on Kato's happiness were Koba's constant absences. Sometimes he'd be away for weeks. When he came back unexpectedly, he would always be greeted with a good meal. Koba was surprised. How did you know I was coming home today? She lowered her eyes shyly. I felt it. 
The Georgians have a tradition that still survives in places that a woman does not have the right to sit at a table with a man. She should stand beside him, ready to serve at any moment. But Koba breached this tradition intentionally. He vividly remembered how his father was outraged if his mother was unable to stand near the table, even though she had lots of work to do. He would not be like his father. Koba asked Kato to sit at the table beside him. He put food on her plate and sat so that he could look at her. Once, Alexander Svanitze came round and saw his sister sitting at the table. He threw her an indignant look. How dare she eat a lavish meal in the presence of her husband? Kato's heart stopped beating. She hoped Koba would explain that he liked to watch her eat. But instead, Koba started shouting and complaining that Kato was bad-mannered and ignored traditions. Svanidze could not look him in the eyes. When Alexander left, Koba started scolding his wife. He shouted and stamped his feet. Why hadn't she been sensible and hidden the plate under the table? As he was scolding Cato, he began to despise himself for behaving like his father, the man he hated and never wanted to resemble. Cato burst into tears. Her tears broke Koba's heart. He clasped her to his chest and whispered, Forgive me, Cato. She forgave him. But since then, uninvited guests would often find a place with unfinished supper under the table. Over the years, Koba's eccentricity would develop into a real mania for Stalin. He liked to force people to eat and drink, for when a person is eating or drinking, he is especially vulnerable. His actions were rebuffed only once when at a crowded reception in the Kremlin, he shouted at his second wife, Nadezhda Alilueva, Hey, why don't you drink? She replied, I am not your hey. Next morning, Nadezhda Alilueva was found dead. She had shot herself. In 1907, Cato gave birth to a son, Jakov. Koba saw him only in November, when he returned after a number of successful exes. When he arrived home, he was surprised to find supper was not on the table. Cato had a fever. After labor, she fell ill with typhus. In the morning, she died. Koba was destroyed. Witnesses said that during the funeral, he jumped into his wife's grave. He cried during the funeral and said, this creature made my stone heart turn soft. Now she is gone and I have no warm feelings left for humanity. Koba would subsequently die, making way for Comrade Stalin's rise to power. At the summit of power, he would turn on the new horoscope to separate Stalin the ruler from the half-educated seminary student Jugashvili and the terrorist and criminal Koba forever. The new Stalin would need a new ideologically perfect biography written. There would be no room for any facts about the real Joseph Jugashvili. He would change his horoscope and his biography, but he could never change who he was. Сам Сталин самого себя от своего образа отделял. Вот образ Сталина вождя, 
отразился в э, том гороскопе, который он включил для всего советского народа. Это Сталин вождь. Но жил он по своему собственному гороскопу, о котором мало кто знал. This dualism was the cause of his unending fear, the fear that he would be unmasked. The new Stalin was never able to renounce the ghost of his past, a past that did not match the image of a superman, an undisputable leader, a born ruler of the masses. This is the death mask of Joseph Stalin. Looking at it, you can easily understand what kind of a person he really was. Я, например, бы никогда не сказал, что это железный стальной человек. Вообще вот такие вот э, линии носа и э, глаз, вот выпуклые глаза, говорят о гордыне и деспотичности, о человеке, который был уверен в себе. Я говорю, единственное здесь чертой – это линия подбородка. Нетерпелив, горяч, вспыльчив, слишком пристрастен. Вот это действительно, к сожалению, это есть, реально. И, конечно, низко посаженные брови, брови э, человека, фиксирующегося на обидах. Вот откуда они the only things that disclose his internal lack of self-confidence are his ears their position on the head is too low usually such ears belong to people who are not destined to become great however these men can become great if they reinvent themselves. Это люди, учащиеся, которые учатся на своих ошибках. Очень редкая линия ушей. Для человека, который сам себя сделал, это ли эти линии ушей идеальные. Это которые все запоминают, которые живут в прошлом, для которых ни один день не является лишним и напрасным, которые постоянно возвращаются к тому, что они прожили раньше. Even having reinvented himself and gaining power, he turned his back on his past with maniacal consistency. As if waiting to be stabbed in the back by all those people who had witnessed the mistakes of his youth. From those who remembered his terrorist acts and robberies. And from those who suspected that Koba worked for the secret political police. Kamo, a faithful friend of Koba, died in 1922 under strange circumstances. He was run over by a car. This was odd, because there were very few cars in Tbilisi. Alexander Zvanidze, Koba's closest comrade and brother of his beloved wife, would be arrested and executed in August 1941. A little earlier, in 1937, Maria Svanidze, who had been a frequent guest of the younger sister Cato and her husband Joseph 30 years ago, would also be shot. Stalin hoped that if he killed anyone associated with his former life, there would be no one to unmask left to him. But he was wrong. Living a lie tormented him for the rest of his life. Gradually, that fear of being uncovered developed into paranoia for the tyrant who had ruined the lives of millions of innocent people. In 1973, in a small U.S. country estate, President Richard Nixon was waiting for the arrival of a special guest, the General Secretary of the USSR, Leonid Brezhnev. A chic car stopped near the entrance. The car door opened, and from it appeared a delicate woman's leg. A pretty blonde got out of the car. Behind her appeared the figure of the Soviet leader. Nixon hurried towards them. He stretched out his hand and froze. Rather than responding with a broad smile, Brezhnev gave the president his mistress's hand. This had never happened before. Only Leonid Brezhnev would have dared to do that. He 
He was a connoisseur of female beauty. He had over 50 lovers, nurses, singers, flight attendants, women of different profession and social status. Their only similarity was their appearance. All Brezhnev's mistresses were short, fair-haired and light-eyed. They looked quite ordinary. But it was his obsession with this look that would become his curse. Leonid Brezhnev could barely move, spoke with difficulty, breathed heavily and complained of memory lapses. In people's memory, he remained a laughing stock. <laughs> but few knew that Brezhnev had not always been like this. He was the youngest member of the Politburo. He was in good health, loved hunting and motor racing. He used to be happy and cheerful. But a personal tragedy had undermined his physical health. His unrequited love for a woman had driven him crazy. He became a drug addict and ruined his life. Novorossiysk, 1943. He was rushing through the thick smoke like a madman. The Germans suddenly attacked. The field was illuminated with bright flashes dead soldiers and blood everywhere. His ears rang to the sound of cannon fire. No one was left to operate the machine gun, so Leonid grabbed it. He started to frantically shoot at the enemy. There were not enough rounds. He knew this was the end. Help would not come. He suddenly heard a terrible whistling noise. The last thing he remembered was an unbearable pain piercing through his body. His hands were stained with blood. Leonid blacked out. Several days later, he came round. When he looked at himself in the mirror, he shuddered. His face was in bandages. He tried to talk but the searing pain pierced his jaw. Later, Brezhnev was informed that during the battle, a grenade had exploded near him. A splinter hit him in the jaw. He underwent a serious operation, but doctors could give no guarantees of a full recovery. He had never felt so weak and helpless. The handsome Brezhnev could no longer recognize himself. When he looked in the mirror, he saw a monster. He furiously tried to rip off the bandages, but a hand stopped him. Leonid looked up. A blonde girl with kind eyes was looking at him. Brezhnev froze. What a beauty. The thought that she might pity him was unbearable. In desperation, he turned away. A month later, his bandages would be removed and Leonid would not recognize himself. His mouth was distorted and he had a swollen face. The former political instructor of the 18th Army had lost his good looks. The man in the mirror could not utter a word. His jawbone hadn't healed properly, so Leonid Brezhnev lost his power of speech. Despite the pain, he tried to read, but he could only make a wheezing noise. But for several weeks, Brezhnev exercised his jaw in an attempt to speak. But it was all in vain. He wanted to scream out in pain and frustration. Would he, a political instructor, remain handicapped forever? 
he wouldn't be able to communicate with his people, his career would surely be over. In desperation, Leonid threw a book at the wall. He was sobbing into his pillow when suddenly he heard a calm, soothing voice. Tamara was reading his book aloud carefully, articulating each word. No, she was not mocking him. Her voice trembled. She didn't want to offend this broken, devastated man. Leonid was ashamed. She remained at his side, comforting and caring for him. When Brezhnev had a fever, she wouldn't sleep. Leonid was enlightened. He was afraid to move. He listened to her, hoping that this moment would go on forever. For the next days, Tamara returned to his bedside. Thanks to her, Brezhnev learned to speak again and restore his diction. He could no longer imagine himself without this woman. She gave him back his hope and confidence. A long forgotten feeling had been reawakened. Brezhnev had fallen madly in love. Tamara felt sure that they would get married. She didn't care if Brezhnev was 40 and she was only 20. Most importantly, they loved each other. But fate would decide otherwise. Tamara, a field hospital doctor, would be remembered not as the wife of the future general secretary, but as his most painful mystery. High-ranking servicemen often had what was known as regimental wives. Tamara was just such a wife to Leonid Brezhnev. She'd been living with him for a very long time. However, she remained a mysterious legend. Leonid sneaked into the room. Tamara sat motionlessly on a chair. He silently approached and gently covered her eyes. However, Tamara did not move. Leonid understood that something had happened. He noticed a newspaper lying nearby. On the front page, there was a picture of Leonid Brezhnev in full colonel's uniform. And beneath it was an article about his heroic feat during which he had been severely wounded. The colonel and political instructor, Comrade Brezhnev, helped repel the German attack. After suffering heavy losses, the Germans retreated. The article mentioned Brezhnev's previous achievements, his military exploits and his personal qualities. But in the newspaper, there was also a seemingly unimportant sentence. An exemplary party member and a great family man. But these words played a crucial role in the fate of the future general secretary. Leonid lowered his eyes. He couldn't hide any longer. He hadn't told her that he already had a wife and two children. He didn't tell her because he was afraid that if Tamara knew about it, she would leave him and he couldn't imagine his life without her. In desperation, Brezhnev threw himself at the feet of his lover, begging her for forgiveness and understanding. But Tamara didn't seem to hear. A fearful Leonid promised to leave his wife and children. When the war was over, they would be together as they had dreamed.
But soon, Brezhnev would be discharged from the hospital and returned to the front. From there, he would write letters both to his family, waiting in Moscow, and to his beloved woman, who would secretly pray to God that her loved one would be safe. This went on for two years when the good news arrived. The Soviet troops had captured Berlin. The war was over and he could finally go home. 1945, Moscow. He slowly walked up the stairs. He could already see the door of his apartment. Leonid knew that his children and Victoria were waiting for him. They had been married for 20 years. The love between them had long gone. But it was replaced with sincere friendship, along with two of the most beautiful children in the world. Leonid hadn't seen his family for four years during the war. And now he came to announce that he was leaving for another woman. She was already waiting in anticipation in the small flat in Moscow. The future of his children, wife and lover, depended on him. He pressed the doorbell. The door opened immediately. The apartment became full of cheerful hubbub. They hugged and kissed him. The children have changed so much. They have grown up. Leonid's heart sank. He was very fond of them, but he could not lie anymore. That same evening, Leonid and Victoria had a difficult conversation. He told his wife everything, about meeting Tamara, about their feelings for each other, which he had been hiding for two years. He was explaining everything and asking for forgiveness. But Brezhnev did not realize that his 16-year-old daughter, Galina, had been listening to him. Her father's words were very painful to listen to. How could he do this to them? Galina wanted to believe that her father loved her and her mother, but she couldn't. Leonid was afraid to look into his wife's eyes. His heart was breaking. He felt terrible guilt. Vika didn't cry or cause a scandal. If she had done, it would have been easier for Leonid. But his wife remained silent. It made it harder. Gradually, she came to her senses. She refused to stay and said she would file for divorce. He could go to the other woman, provided that Leonid remained in the house until morning so he could explain everything to the children. Brezhnev had no choice. He agreed, not realizing the terrible consequences of his decision. His wife was a difficult woman. In appearance, she was very similar to Mao Zedong. If you compare these two portraits, I think you'll find a lot in common. He suffered constantly. Only the state security authorities were protecting him. They were trying to isolate Leonid Brezhnev from these troubles. That night, he didn't sleep. He was turning and moaning. He blamed himself for being such a coward. The guilt haunted him. His eyes were watering, but he couldn't sleep. He tried to convince himself that he needed to explain everything to his children. He simply had no choice. He couldn't lie to Tamara a second time. He walked around the apartment. The children were sleeping. Leonid entered his wife's room. The bed was made. Vika hadn't gone to bed. His wife was not there. Confused, 
Leonid went to see the one who would understand, the one who would calm and comfort him. He forcefully pulled the door handle. The apartment was unlocked. He rushed inside. Why was it so quiet, and where was Tamara? In the middle of the room sat a hunched female figure. She turned. Leonid froze. Vika looked at him calmly. She had found the apartment address on a receipt that was lying in Brezhnev's jacket pocket. While Leonid was at home, she went to visit the woman who was about to destroy her family. Looking into his wife's eyes, everything began to make sense. Tamara was gone for good. No, this cannot happen. What has Vika told her? A crazy thought ran through his head. Run after her, make her come back, no matter what. I must say, that was one of his most important qualities that manifested itself both in his personal life and in his politics. He was a stubborn man. His obstinacy was legendary. He could break through anything. Gas pedal to the floor, 120 kilometers per hour on the speedometer. He was driving like a madman. Sweat filled his eyes. He can see the station, but there is not much time. He must get Tamara back. For the first time in his life, he was running at full speed, elbowing his way through the crowds. He ran past irritated passers-by and noisy market sellers. He looked, but couldn't see her. He feared he may never see her again. In the distance, he saw a familiar figure. He felt the tears well as he rushed towards her. He grabbed her and held her close. He found her at last. He kissed her urgently on her cheeks, lips, shoulders. Fearful he might lose her again. He didn't care that the whole station was watching them. He had found her and would not lose her again. Tamara gently released herself from his embrace. He looked at her with horror. He would never let her go again. But Tamara quietly broke their embrace. Leonid was petrified. He looked at her helplessly. Leonid would never forget the sight of that petite female figure slowly disappearing into the crowd. He could not remember how he managed to drive back he didn't know where he was or what he was doing. Suddenly, it was all about Tamara. He saw her every delicate profile, every blonde silhouette, every time he wanted to move forward, to cry out with joy, but it was all in vain. She was no longer in the crowd. He would not go after his Tamara again but he would never be able to forget her either. In Leonid Brezhnev's broken heart, there arose an unusual hatred. He blamed his wife for taking away his precious Tamara. He would seldom appear at home and put all his energy into his work. He built a successful career and became a trusted associate of General Secretary Nikita Khrushchev. And when the time came, he would take his place and start a new era in Soviet history. Of course, in many respects, Brezhnev was politically naive compared with his predecessors, Lenin, Stalin, and even Khrushchev. 
The era of Brezhnev is a peaceful, stagnant backwater. Perhaps people needed to sit and think. To contemplate the snow falling outside the window, not the ranks of prisoners, the tanks or the marching troops. It's not interesting to watch these things. In a sense, the Brezhnev era had been blessed. The position of general secretary would bring him unlimited power and many privileges, such as a collection of unique weapons and 300 of the best vintage cars in the world. He had a huge fleet of vehicles, including Lincolns, Cadillacs, Rolls Royces, Zills and Mercedes. He loved them all, used to drive them himself. The guards were behind him naturally. Sometimes we had a flat tire. We would hurriedly change the wheel and try to catch up with him. But rarely could, because he drove so fast. As well as cars, he also collected gorgeous women. They all looked the same, slender, blonde, blue-eyed. Brezhnev would drown his pain in their embraces, seeing Tamara in each one of them. Translators, flight attendants, typists and singers came and went. Brezhnev had no time to remember their names. He shocked the world with his amazing escapades. But nobody realized that the man with the sincere smile, who boasted about his amorous conquests, was in fact miserable. From the outside, everything seemed fine. A successful person, a prominent politician, a lady killer. There were many women on his list. A residence keeper in Zavidovo Anna, a maid from Zarechia Dacha Maria, a secretary Alla, the daughter of communist leader of Bulgaria, Lyudmila Zhivkova. The KGB regularly supplied the leader with pretty blonde lovers. Brezhnev didn't object. To him, it was like a game. For example, in Sochi, he met a singer, Anna Shalfiva, who worked in the local Philharmonic Society. With the help of his orderly, or Batman, he locked her up in a room. She was outraged by his boorish behavior. She managed to escape through an open window. Leonid Brezhnev tried to make up with her by giving her flowers and courting her. Gradually, he broke down her resistance. Brezhnev had another secret life carefully concealed by the general secretary. It began after Tamara left. He didn't sleep well. He tossed and turned all night, then in the morning fell into a deep sleep for a few hours. Brezhnev hoped his insomnia would pass, but it got worse with age. His problems were being destroyed before his eyes. He couldn't forgive his wife for the grief he had suffered. Brezhnev and his wife were gradually drifting apart, but Victoria seemed resigned. She didn't blame him for his love affairs and silently put up with them. Her silence drove him mad. Brezhnev did not know what to think. Very soon, 
he would pay dearly for his wife's sufferings. The Suburbs of Moscow, 1972. He heard a terrible din in the sitting room and ran out into the corridor. His daughter Galina could barely stand. Brezhnev couldn't hold back his anger. His assistants brought him a picture of Galina dancing the can-can on a table with naked legs and skirt pulled up. This was not the first time she had behaved this way. Galia was drinking, his son Yura was drinking, you understand? But it was all concealed. Victoria Petrovna had been suffering from this affliction. She knew all the details. Leonid Brezhnev did not know everything. He had two concerns. Firstly, his daughter's affairs, including Maris Lipa and Kio, an illusionist. His son was an alcoholic who would go to Red Square and proclaim that Brezhnev was a fool. <laughs> he was arrested, but when they realized who he was, he was released. It was not easy for Brezhnev to deal with. It was painful for Brezhnev to watch Galina. Another failed marriage, hard drinking. He wanted her to stay and talk, but drunken Galina laughed in his face. Brezhnev lost his temper and slapped her. She soon came to her senses. She gave her father a long, withering look and then left without saying a word. Brezhnev did not know that Galina's scandalous behavior was revenge for hurting her mother. Fights with his wife continued until Brezhnev broke up with Tamara. He couldn't forgive his wife for the grief he'd suffered. Brezhnev was gradually drifting apart from his family. But even then, Victoria seemed resigned. He didn't remember her blaming him for his amorous adventures. Galina hadn't forgotten about crying in her room all those years ago when she heard about her father's unfaithfulness. How she blamed herself for her parents fighting and watching her father continuing to taunt her mother. Galina had become angry and now sought vengeance. For the first time in his life, Brezhnev slapped his child. She had grown up under these circumstances, but much of it was his fault. Brezhnev adored his Galina, indulged all of her whims, but his daughter became fretful and spoiled. Previously, he'd put up with her tricks, but now, because of the insomnia, despair tore at Brezhnev's heart. He had to do something. And Brezhnev had found a solution. He remembered the innocent pills to relieve stress recommended to him by his comrades from the Politburo. The general secretary hated pills and never called for doctors. But he simply saw no other solution. Insomnia was ruining his life and driving him mad. Taking life-saving pills was the only solution. That night, he slept like a baby. There were no horrible visions. Panic and fear had vanished. In the morning, for the first time in several years, he woke up refreshed and rested, all thanks to the innocent pills. From then on, he would take them on a daily basis. The state of the general secretary improved. Fatigue and nervousness disappeared. He felt full of strength and inspiration. Brezhnev couldn't imagine that soon he would become addicted to the pills. To intensify the sleeping pills effect, he would take them with vodka. 
this heady mixture would be the beginning of the end. As well as soothing, the medicine at Noxiron, like diphenhydramine, also has a psychotropic effect. When taken in large doses, it turns into a drug, and when mixed with alcohol, it can be a killer. He became addicted to sleeping pills. In the beginning, he took one pill, but within a few months, he was taking two or three. Someone said, Leonid Ilyich, I take a pill with alcohol. He asked, does it help? And one of the Politburo members answered, yes, it helps. And then, little by little, it got to the point that we were forced to dissolve vodka in water so that he wouldn't go too far. Moscow, 1972. The USSR was celebrating the 55th anniversary of the October Revolution. The atmosphere in the Column Hall of the House of the Unions was solemn. Recently, workers, peasants, soldiers and party members were being awarded. Faces were radiant with smiles. Everyone was euphoric. A smiling Brezhnev was meeting the guests of honor. Next to the general secretary sat his secretary, who was also his new passion. Faces were flashing. Brezhnev felt dizzy and terribly sleepy. Occupied by his own thoughts, he didn't notice himself shaking the hand of the next guest, a general. He was thanking Brezhnev for a medal, but Leonid didn't care. Then from behind the military man came a blonde woman, not young, but beautiful, with a painfully familiar face. Brezhnev froze. He couldn't breathe. His heart was pounding. Surely it could not be her. Tamara left Moscow many years before. He thought he would never see her again. But there she is, so close. So close, and yet so distant. He didn't know what to say. Tamara looked at him with calm, confident eyes. She was no longer a naive little girl whose eyes shone with love and affection. Life had changed her. There in the north was born another Tamara, one who had forgotten how to feel. Her memories had been erased. Brezhnev didn't know that she had married a general and was living a quiet life. He was looking at her with a long, piercing gaze. Tamara gently took her hand away. The general secretary felt unwell. He walked through the crowd, wanting only one thing, to escape. Brezhnev was driving his car through narrow country roads. He didn't care where. His hands were trembling. He wanted to get rid of this strange obsession. Brezhnev felt the car judder as it raced towards the ditch. At the last minute, he managed to drive off to the side. He breathed heavily, not understanding why he'd stopped. And then he began to cry like a baby. Weak and powerless, he had failed to take his own miserable life. The general secretary instinctively felt for the pills in his pocket, but they were not there. His head was spinning, his hands were shaking. He felt a terrible throbbing pain. His head felt as though it would explode. When he came to his senses, Victoria was sobbing next to him. She told him that he had just suffered a severe stroke. She begged him not to kill himself, but Brezhnev didn't care about anything. 
очень странный был момент. It was a very strange moment in the life of Leonid Brezhnev. He was banned from smoking and drinking. He could no longer drive his car. He had slowed down. He asked, am I a czar or am I not a czar? He had great power, but was cut off from everything. He decided to fight for his own freedom. The only thing that he still had. His freedom to take pills with vodka, knowing that such a combination was poisoning his body. One thing intensifies the other. He demanded sleeping pills with vodka for dinner and became addicted. He realized that the drug was much more effective taken this way. In just a few months, he had become very ill. In 1976, he survived a clinical death, then a heart attack. A year later, while on holiday, he would fall asleep while swimming. His guards only just managed to bring the general secretary round. Now, the great and mighty USSR was governed by a weak, feeble old man who could barely move or talk, sometimes forgetting where he was and not seeing the line between reality and delusions. He was no longer interested in public affairs. Brezhnev shifted his routine and responsibilities. Here is what the foreign policy propaganda of the USSR, Valentin Falin, wrote. Our department was subordinated directly to Brezhnev, but endorsing the papers, the general secretary didn't decide anything. The more papers he was slipped, the less he realized what was behind these papers. Thus, in 1979, peace-loving Brezhnev, who opposed army conflicts, signed an order to bring troops into Afghanistan. And when he realized what he'd done, he decided to resign. He stopped understanding anything. I remember this phrase stuck in my ears. I was watching one of the congresses, the 24th Party Congress, or maybe one of his speeches. He'd finished reading, looked at all those present in the hall like this, said in his Brezhnev style, rattled off. <laughs> and left. <laughs> With a heavy heart, his wife watched what her Leonid was turning into. She was extremely happy when he decided to retire. But these dreams wouldn't come true. Brezhnev couldn't resign. They had persuaded the sickly and feeble general secretary that the country needed him. And Brezhnev believed them. Behind his back, a clique of party functionaries wanted this to last as long as possible, so there wouldn't be anyone to restore order. Then, of course, it turned into a farce. Everyone laughed. Now, the entire world was laughing at Brezhnev. The West which had once so candidly met the Soviet leader, was openly mocking him. While visiting abroad, Brezhnev, as always, stood in the car and welcomed friendly people. But no one knew that a bodyguard was helping him to stand. Leonid Brezhnev couldn't keep his balance. He was taking more and more sleeping pills. He was literally begging doctors and security guards for pills. As a result, they began to hide drugs from him. Everyone was ordering his pills. I know that through Andropov, they ordered fake pills in Switzerland. He could easily call you in the middle of the night and say, it's not working, I will take these. He had his own supply. Sometimes he would ask people from the Politburo. 
we often had to ask people he was close to, comrades, please do not give your medicines to Leonid Ilyich. You will kill him. Brezhnev jumped out of his bed. Outside the window, he saw a strange shadow. Something was quietly knocking on the glass. He covered his ears and tried to sleep. But without the usual pills, he could not fall asleep. Of course, his wife had some pills, but she'd hidden them. He decided to go and find them. Brezhnev crept into Victoria's bedroom and looked through her drawers, but the drugs weren't there. They were in a special locked place. Brezhnev could not resist. He woke up Vika and begged her to give him the pills, but his wife was adamant. So he picked the lock and with joyful eyes went back to his own bedroom. He poured several pills onto his palm. After a moment, he felt relief. His head began to swim, and then suddenly, he seemed to awake from a nightmare. Brezhnev saw himself sitting on the floor as an old hunched man. His body was trembling. No, this can't be him. What has happened during these few years? What has he become? It was disgusting and embarrassing, sick, lonely, and useless. Like a madman, he was swaying and whispering something to himself. Suddenly, someone's tender arms embraced him. He raised his head. Victoria was looking at him with love and affection. Brezhnev could not resist. He hid his face in her shoulder and folded her in his arms, as if afraid that she would disappear. For the first time in many years, he was grateful to her for her support and affection. Victoria gently lifted him up. She put him to bed as if he was a child. She stroked his head. Brezhnev's eyes opened. She was always there for him. She tolerated his unfaithfulness, resentments. She looked after him when he was ill. He had many women. All his life, he had been chasing a ghost. And yet all this time, near here was a woman who truly loved and needed him. He wanted to fall on his knees and ask for forgiveness, but he felt sleepy. For the first time in his life, Brezhnev did not want to fall asleep. But the effect of the pills was irreversible. A happy smile lit up his face. Brezhnev knew exactly what to do. He would give up taking the pills. He would get back his life and finally tell Victoria the truth. He will tell her that he was wrong, that he loves her, and she will surely forgive him. He fell asleep with a happy smile on his face. Nothing to fear or worry about now. Only warmth, peace at last. His body was found in the morning. Doctors stated that Brezhnev had died painlessly and quietly. His heart stopped while he was asleep. Nineteen fifty three, Moscow. A car approached a small mansion on Malonikitskaya Street. Out of it appeared Colonel Korotkov and several servicemen. The colonel showed the guards his ID of the USSR Interior Ministry. Secret documents. I must deliver them personally. Come in. Korotkov and the soldiers entered the cabinet. Before them sat a man in pince-nez. He immediately knew why these people had come to him. He rushed to the briefcase and pulled out a gun. 
At that moment, the military men opened fire. People in the street stopped when they heard shooting in the mansion. In the cabinet, however, it was all over. Soldiers quickly covered the body with canvas and loaded it into the car. So without a trial, the Minister of Internal Affairs, Lavrenti Pavlovich Beria, had been killed. He'd been the most influential person in the country, the main contender to the throne, recently vacated by Stalin. He was killed on the orders of Khrushchev, with the support of Malenkov, Molotov and Kaganovich. They were pushed into murder by an animalistic fear of Beria. They saw in him shades of the late Stalin. A brutal executioner responsible for taking more than 600,000 lives. It was he who in 1937 organized the most atrocious repression in the USSR. He had legalized torture and executed prisoners without trial. Under his rule, the NKVD had become the most powerful institution in the state. He was regarded as all-powerful. He was feared by the entire country, even by Stalin himself. But no one knew that Beria also lived in fear. For him, every day might be his last. And to survive, Beria had to fight, to plot, and to kill. And he was guided not by desire to gain favor, or even a lust for power. We will remove weeds and plow up Georgia. But fear was taken to absurd levels. Nineteen twenty one. Baku. He was looking at the men who'd been taken from the house. He knew what would happen next. Soldiers would put them against the wall. There would be a command to pull the trigger. Young Beria was the last in a row of those who were to shoot. He was looking at the people near the wall, but didn't want to kill any of them. His finger trembled on the trigger. But there was no command. Lavrenti's knees were giving way. He simply couldn't kill a man. A wave of horror swept over his body. Only one question stuck in his head. Why? Nineteen eighteen. Baku. Bloodstained, he was sitting in the cabinet and couldn't understand what was going on. Why were they beating him? What did these people want? Lavrenti Beria, a young architect and excellent student, couldn't answer these questions. Sometime before, he had received a diploma and along with it, a long-awaited chance to finally get out of poverty. He had been determined to succeed. As a child, Lavrenti painted amazing icons. Beria remembered showing these works to his father. Pavel Beria, amazed at his son's talents, sold half his house in order to send his boy to college. His father's faith paid off. First, Lavrenti graduated from Sukumi School, then from a prestigious architectural technical school in Baku. He received his first order and was relieved to have a chance to bring his family out of poverty and to thank his father, who had sacrificed so much. In those days, the future seemed happy and carefree. Then one day, two men came up to him in the street. They showed him some paperwork. 
It was an offer to cooperate with the Bolshevik party, which was leading a fierce struggle to gain power in the country. Its main opponent was the Musavat Nationalist Party, which proclaimed the idea of Azerbaijan's independence and which for several years the Bolsheviks tried to unsuccessfully force out. Lavrenti didn't realize that he had been chosen deliberately. Among Beria's friends from the technical school were sympathizers of the Musavat party. So the guy had to learn who they were. And to do this, he had to become a secret agent. They tried to persuade him, they beat him, but Lavrenti was adamant. And then strangers dragged him to the window. Beria froze in horror. In the yard, he saw his former classmate with his hands tied. Their eyes met for a moment. He was staring at the body of the man he had just shot. He had pulled the trigger. Beria didn't want to kill, but there was no other choice. He became a Czechist. What did it mean? Leather jacket, revolver and food rations? Yes, but there was more to it than that. Being Czechist was all about surviving, and he was desperate to live. He knew it as he looked through the window at all those innocent people who had been executed. Suddenly, he had been seized by animal fear. Obeying this fear, Beria signed a hidden paper of cooperation, not realizing there would be no turning back. He was filtered into the Muscovat secret service. In that part of Transcaucasia, which is now Azerbaijan, the Musavat Republic was formed. In this territory were Turkish forces, and Beria, filtered into their organization, was passing information to the Bolsheviks. Every time he pulled the trigger, he was convinced that it would be the last time. Soon, they would let him go. And then, it will all work out again. He will forget the nightmarish past. Eventually, due to the efforts of secret agents, the Bolsheviks managed to seize power in Azerbaijan. In 1922, the country joined the USSR. Beria had completed his mission, but no one was going to let him go. 1924, Soviet Georgia. Beria would remember that day for the rest of his life. He, a young Czechist, had the great honor of pouring wine during a party of prominent Bolsheviks in Georgia. The people who gathered around the table had made a revolution in Georgia. They rightly considered themselves its creators. And now they were receiving a guest from Moscow. Everyone considered the guest an upstart who had made his career murdering people. And now he came to bring the order in Georgia. As Beria was pouring the wine, his hand trembled. Beria met the man's eyes. It was Stalin. Beria felt the man's immense power. Stalin raised his glass and made a toast. 
There is a great deal of weed in Georgia. It is therefore necessary to plow up Georgia. A heavy silence descended over the table. All those Bolsheviks realized that the next day, they too might be called the weed. Beria also understood this. A chill swept over his body. This was his chance. It's now or never. We will remove weed and plow up Georgia. He drank his wine and put the empty glass on the table. Everything went dark. Lavrenti didn't seem to notice Stalin's fixed gaze. He didn't see the strict faces of the masters at the table. The next day, Stalin left, and Beria was appointed deputy head of the Cheka in Georgia. Such a prompt promotion surprised everyone. To the old Bolsheviks in Georgia, Beria was an outsider, an upstart, and they started to hate him. But Beria didn't care. He has gained a powerful patron, almost a soulmate, Comrade Stalin. Lavrenti felt happy. The new appointment revived the old barrier. A quiet, reasonable man who for some time forgot about the former dream for the sake of a new one. To justify the trust placed in him, to take care of his safety, finally to prove himself. Beria enthusiastically took to his work. He tracked down spies and sent them to prison. As an architect, he was implementing his most ambitious project, the building of a new state without blood or senseless murders, unlike neighboring Russia. It was an amazing period in Lavrenti's life. He bought back his father's house and began to earn huge amounts of money. But then came a telegram from Moscow. Comrade Stalin was not pleased with the work of the Georgian Cheka. For Beria, it was a death sentence. He was seized by fear. Lavrenti was in despair. Stalin did not appreciate his efforts. At the same time, Beria's colleagues in Moscow executed several hundred spies and enemies of the Soviet rule a week. The Georgian Cheka didn't show even half of these amounts. Stalin wasn't interested in reasons for this. The general secretary demanded victims, and Beria gave them to him. Georgia. He was standing against the wall, terrified, afraid to look into the people's eyes. He didn't need to wait for orders. He now gave the orders. Rumor has it that in Georgia, repressions were even more severe than in other regions of the Soviet Union. Beria was like a mini Stalin. In Moscow, Stalin controls the course of repressions, inflicts resolutions on interrogations and protocols, gives advice on whom to beat and whom to interrogate intensively. Beria does exactly the same in the Transcaucasia. In my opinion, even Baragov, an Azerbaijani, was more reserved. And it was hard for Stalin not to notice this. Beria was fulfilling what he had promised. He became the hands with which Stalin removed Georgian weeds. Fire! He could not get used to this sound. He would wake in the middle of the night, terrified. In his dreams, he saw innocent people being shot without trial. He couldn't sleep. 
Nightmares were driving Lavrenti crazy. And then one night, stupefied by blood, insomnia and fatigue, Beria decided enough. The head of the checker was reading an application. Beria was asking to be allowed to study in the Polytechnic Institute in Baku. He didn't want to be a Czechist. He wanted to live. He had married and wanted to rebuild his life. Lavrenti knew that he might not get out of this room. His young wife waiting outside also knew this. Beria watched his boss with horror. He carefully placed the paper on the table, picked up a pen and raised his eyes. Lavrenti was rooted to the spot. He won't give up, whatever the cost. The chief was looking at him, long and hard. And then, with a sharp stroke of the pen, put his signature under the application. Lavrenti couldn't believe his eyes. They let him go. Silently, without any conditions, the world had changed. It became brighter and more colorful. He hugged his wife. Finally, there was no need to be afraid. He can realize his dream of becoming an architect and eventually, perhaps, to forget the horrors of the past. He was playing football with the boys in the yard. He was shouting and laughing like a child. Finally, a terrible burden fell from his shoulders. His wife was hanging out the washing and smiling, looking at her husband. Their lives were looking up. At first, he didn't notice the black car coming up to the house. Lavrenti stopped playing with the ball. Beria knew something terrible was going to happen. He realized with horror that these people would never let him go. All his dreams were in vain. There is no turning back. He didn't want his family to see them. The arrival of the black car was a bad sign. Lavrenti hastily kissed his confused wife and sat in the car. He stared out of the window. His world was in retreat and all because of the hated system. Beria didn't know that in several years he would become the embodiment of this system. A brutal executioner who in 1937 would kill 600,000 people with one stroke of a pen. A bloody monster who would be murdering people with his own hands, without fear or pangs of conscience. And now he was staring out of the car window, saying goodbye to the carefree world of fun and children's dreams to which he would never return. Later on, Lavrenti learned that the head of Cheka signed only a small vacation permit, and that no one was going to let Beria go. He was simply too valuable. It was the mid-twenties. The old Bolsheviks in the Georgian government didn't accept Stalin as leader, and the general secretary could only establish his authority with reliable and trusted people. Lavrenti Beria found himself on that list. Eventually, Stalin saw in Beria a reliable executioner, a man he could order about like most of his other men with a reputation that may have been considered tarnished, 
Take Vyshinsky, hire Menshevik, who wrote out the order for Lenin's arrest. At any time, Stalin could simply crush him by accusing him for writing that order. The same was true for Beria. 1931, Georgia. He was walking through the CC long corridors. The cabinet doors were closed. The telephones wouldn't stop ringing. There was nobody else there. The sound of a phone ringing in the empty building brought him to his new cabinet. The cabinet of the secretary of the Georgian Communist Party, CC. This was a considerable advance, a huge leap in the career of a young Czechist. But was Beria in fact pleased? No, Stalin's man was hated here. That day, in protest against Beria's appointment, no one went to work. Soon, these people would pay dearly for their action. Beria himself would make sure of it. He wasn't the naive, good-natured architect anymore, but Lord's punishing sword, Stalin's right hand. With the leader's consent, Beria ordered the execution of the entire personnel of Georgia's government. So he fulfilled the precept of Stalin. Beria was no longer interested in the moral aspect of his work. However, while shooting and punishing, he was making more enemies. The hunt for the CC secretary's life had begun. There were several attempted murders, but Beria tried to ignore this fact. He forced himself not to be afraid. However, his fear grew. 1934, Lake Ritza, Abkhazia. Two ordinary families were sitting by the side of a lake. Beria and his friend, the head of Abkhazia, Lakoba, rarely spent their weekend like this. Beria didn't hide his pleasure. He was enjoying these rare, carefree moments. Because of his work, he spent very little time with his family and became increasingly sullen and withdrawn. He couldn't talk to anyone about his worries. Most of all, Beria was afraid that someone would find out about his fear. On that night, Lakoba was tossing and turning, trying to fall asleep. In the distance, he could hear the sound of an engine. Lakoba came out of the tent. The noise stopped. He heard voices. It was a bad sign. Lakoba decided not to wait for what would happen next. He rushed to save his and his friend's family. Lavrenti, wake up, we must leave. Beria grabbed his wife and son. Under cover of darkness, they ran into the nearest ravine. Lavrenti didn't understand why they needed to hurry. What's the worst that could happen at night in a deserted area? Beria looked in horror at the place where a moment ago he had been peacefully sleeping with his family. The tent was riddled with bullets. Lavrenti trembled and turned white. He was seized by animal fear. He wanted to hide to run away from danger. But where could he go? There was no safe place in Georgia. Everybody hated him, from the CC party members to ordinary citizens. But Moscow was another thing. A city where no one knew him, where he could disappear and work quietly, start all over again, and finally forget old fears which were driving him mad. 1934, Tbilisi. Opposite to him sat a woman. Her face was covered with bruises. She was crying, asking for pity. 
but Beria was adamant. He could no longer control himself. He felt no pity. This woman was an obstacle on his way to salvation, on his way to Moscow. I'm the author of this book. My husband is the author of this book. He hit her again and again. She grabbed the book and threw it at him. It was the last straw. A wave of anger overwhelmed him. He looked at the woman's body. He had killed her with his own hands. Without following someone else's order, he had killed her and felt nothing, neither pity nor fear. Like a heartless monster, he murdered a human being over a book. Here is this book. In 1935, in the USSR, it became a bestseller. Beria's work on the history of the Bolshevik organizations in Transcaucasia became Stalin's reference book. It proved that the general secretary, who was on a par as Lenin, was the Bolsheviks' leader and father of the revolution. Officially, it was written by Lavrenti Beria, and no one could prove it to the contrary. A host of writers headed by the Georgian historian Bibinishvili was shot long before the publication, and the last witness had died in Beria's cabinet. Beria was certain that the publishing of the book would be his ticket to Moscow. The book appeared at a very convenient time. It was a special trump card that Beria could use. Comrade Stalin, look, I wrote about you. Is this all correct? Yes, Comrade Beria. Well done. Indeed, Stalin highly praised the work of his Georgian associate, but the leader wasn't in a hurry to invite him to the capital. The assassination attempts on the Georgian Czechist became more frequent. In despair and guided by the instinct of self-preservation, Beria would make the last and the most terrible sacrifice. 1936, Georgia. The two old friends, Lakoba and Beria, were in the theater. Everything was going well. But during the performance, Lakoba felt unwell and left before the final act. Beria stayed. He was admiring the graceful movements of the dancers. Beria was aware that he would never see his friend again. He knew that at that very moment, Lakoba was writhing around in agony. The man who had saved his life had now been poisoned by Beria's hand. Lakoba had signed his death warrant during his conversation with Stalin, where he had refused to organize new repressions in Georgia. But Beria could not refuse. He knew that heading the bloody slaughter in 1937 in Georgia would not only be his ticket to Moscow, but his only way to stay alive. He wouldn't repeat Lakoba's mistake. What was Beria thinking while driving to Moscow? The fact that he had finally reached the top and become powerful? Or the fact that through his new position, he would bring benefit to the state? No. He was once again thinking of his own survival. Beria knew that the higher up the corporate ladder he climbed, the greater the risk to his life. But he could neither refuse nor disappoint Stalin, who had saved his life. 
The fact that he had consistently followed the party line showed that he was a devoted son of the Communist Party and therefore would be a reliable candidate for promotion in Moscow. As he had already proven, with blood, what he was capable of. Stalin appreciated this. Beria knew that only the strongest would survive in the Kremlin menagerie. He was staring out of the car window at a huge field where several farmers were fertilizing the earth with ashes. He was afraid that he too would one day turn to ash. Beria could easily manage the scenario. Being taken out of his house at night and forced into a car. Being beaten during interrogations and then shot. A car takes a barrel full of his ashes to this field where they are scattered. Nourishing the collective farm with their ashes was Stalin's way to deal with Lenin's former associates. He could do the same with anyone. Beria was afraid of the post, entrusted to him by Stalin. None of the previous NKVD chairmen had survived. The organization was previously led by Yagoda. Nikolai Yezhov executed Yagoda along with all of his men. Now, Beria was to clear the NKVD of Yezhov and his men. But Beria couldn't refuse. His gratitude to Stalin for his liberation from Georgia was stronger than the fear of being killed. Beria eagerly set to work, surpassing all his predecessors. During the bloody repressions of 1937 in the USSR alone, more than 600,000 people were executed under Beria's orders. Beria was a reliable executor. He carried out the most bloody and atrocious acts, not to mention the massacring of Poles in 1940 at Katyn. A monstrous act. Execution without trial of more than 22,000 people, prisoners of war and civilians. When he saw how Beria worked, he realized that this man would do any of his dirty work for him. For example, to eliminate the head of the Polish army, or to eliminate people for no reason. So thousands of innocent people were killed at Stalin's behest by Comrade Beria, who was extremely afraid of disappointing his leader. June 21st, 1941, Moscow. He was afraid to look into Stalin's eyes. A moment ago, Beria had received the latest intelligence report. The war was imminent, and he had to report this to the leader. But how? Stalin didn't even want to hear about it. He became furious every time he heard of Germany's attacks. Joseph Vissarionovich, the war will begin tomorrow. But we remember your words and feel sure that Hitler won't attack. Stalin looked at him. Beria was petrified. The leader got up and left the cabinet. Beria didn't dare move. He was expecting the worst. I believe that part of Stalin's political power came from his unpredictability. How will this man react? What will his next move be? 
At any moment, he was ready to use one of his many trump cards, the assassination of certain people. But something incredible happened. After the German invasion, the tyrant Stalin panicked. He stopped responding to calls and went to Dacha. For a week, the country was left without leadership. Beria was amazed. He had never seen Stalin like this. He wouldn't tell anyone about their leader's terrible cowardice. Instead, Beria would take leadership of the country. He would create a united authority in the USSR for the period of the war, the State Defense Committee. Beria would visit Stalin and persuade him to hand over the leadership. In this way, he would save the tragic situation on the fronts of World War II. Beria was proud of his ingenuity. His services in the war would be a suitable thank you for Stalin's miraculous rescue. I don't see why people call a man like Beria manager. Above all, he was an executioner and a hangman. As a leader of the state security, he personally tortured, poisoned and beat people under investigation in his cabinet. Of course, he always blamed Stalin. Beria became confident. The fear that had tormented him for so long had disappeared. Though he had lost connection with his family, though his wife was afraid of him and couldn't understand him, now he felt he had much more than just a family. He had boundless power, dozens of mistresses, and the patronage of the leader. Stalin was indebted to him for his salvation, and he was keen to show his gratitude. 1949, Moscow. The news received from Khrushchev of what happened at Stalin's dacha kept Beria awake at night. During dinner, the leader suddenly got up and called his two old friends to follow him into the bathroom. Stalin turned on the shower, looked around and whispered. Beria knew exactly what this meant. Stalin wanted him removed. But there was something else. Now, Beria realized that the tables had been turned. Stalin was now afraid of him. It was the final signal. Beria knew he could not wait any longer. After so many years of loyal service, Stalin wanted to get rid of him. But Beria would take brutal revenge for the fear that had followed him around for so many years. He would survive. He would make sure that the man who ruined his life would be dead. Beria, Khrushchev, Malenkov and Bulganin gathered that evening and planned everything in detail. First, they needed to remove the leader's closest men, his personal secretary, Posk Rebyshev, and his security chief, General Vlasic. Then, at another dinner at the dacha, Stalin must suffer a stroke that would kill him immediately, leaving no chance of survival. Stalin must die in front of witnesses. Also, there must be doctors and children. The plan was agreed, and they began to act. 1953. Stalin's dacha. The day had come. All the conspirators gathered at Stalin's dacha in Kuntsevo. Beria seemed jolly. He was smiling and joking. Years spent in fear made him a wonderful actor.
However, inside, another fear was growing. Any of the conspirators could be a traitor, and then it would be his end. At the table, there was a playful atmosphere. Stalin was smiling and puffing his pipe. Beria was watching his every move. He noticed his leader had suddenly become gloomy. The poison was working. Stalin got up from the table. He said goodnight to the guests, complaining of fatigue. Beria went after him. It was I who first claimed that Stalin had been poisoned back in 2001 in my first book. Today, there are stories telling that they analyzed Stalin's medical history. They consulted doctors and found out that there was poison in his blood. He was standing outside the door, listening to the man wheezing behind the wall. Nearby stood a frightened Khrushchev. A medical team had been waiting all day for Beria's permission to enter the leader's bedroom. He didn't leave the door for a minute. Beria felt wide awake. With fear and delight, he was awaiting the end. Beria was looking at Stalin's face, seeing not a human, but his own fear. And now, this fear was dying in front of him. Here it was, the moment had come. Beria could hardly hold back his inner triumph. He had won his long battle. Kristalev, a car! Kristalev was Stalin's personal driver, and he didn't obey Beria. Beria was no longer afraid. Now, he was the personification of that fear to others. In his order given to Khrushchev, there was an open claim to the empty throne. However, Beria was not destined to get it. Ten AM, June twenty eighth, nineteen fifty three, Moscow. It was a usual working morning. He was sitting in his cabinet. It had been two months since Stalin's death, and Beria had a lot of plans. He was preparing a huge transformation in the country. That morning, he was in a wonderful mood. He was the only member of the CC Presidium who openly expressed his joy of Stalin's death. This, of course, was an indiscretion, because he had to understand that the leaders, his other associates, still idolized Stalin. And, of course, they saw him as an enemy. He felt that his life had just begun. He didn't notice a car approaching the house or the people getting out of it. Secret documents. I must deliver them personally. Come in. The doors opened with a bang. Armed servicemen ran into the cabinet. Beria realized that his former allies had betrayed him. He rushed for the gun in his briefcase, but it was too late. People in the street stopped when they heard the gunshot in the mansion. In the cabinet, it was all over. The official history says that Beria had a long trial and only then was shot as a state criminal. In fact,
he died six months before his documented date of death. Beria's murder was staged this way. The Presidium of the CC was informed that there was data incriminating Beria of the organization of armed conspiracy. They needed to invite Beria to the Presidium and interrogate him. What if Beria refused to come to the Presidium? Khrushchev ordered to send two generals to bring Beria to the Presidium. When the generals returned, they informed them that Beria had resisted and therefore had been killed. They declared that Beria had been arrested and there was an ongoing investigation. But Beria was already dead. His body was buried in the Lubyanka's courtyard, along with all his personal belongings. All except the desperate fear that was responsible for the death of hundreds of thousands of innocent people.